Hello, welcome back to the show. This episode of the Jolly Swagman podcast is brought to you by Freelancer.com. Freelancer.com is the world's largest crowdsourcing marketplace, both by number of users and projects posted, with over 40 million users and 17 million projects posted. Full disclaimer, I know the CEO, Matt Barry. He's a great guy, a very uncorrelated thinker, who's appeared on this podcast before, and Matt has produced a true Aussie startup success story. Freelancer.com is where you go if you want to start a business or take an existing one to the next level. It does this by connecting entrepreneurs, aka you, with entrepreneurs around the world, aka freelancers. Here are some of the things they can get you help with. Getting a website built, a mobile app developed, graphics designed, or even something more complicated like financial research. You can hire skilled professionals inexpensively for almost anything. In fact, there are over 1,600 different categories of work on freelancer.com. 1,600. It's free to post a project and get quotes, so why not try it out? No job is too big or too small. Go to freelancer.com and post your project today to turn your dreams into reality. Doesn't that sound good? This episode of the podcast is also brought to you by Blinkist. Blinkist is an app that condenses key takeaways from the best nonfiction books in the world into 15-minute blinks, which you can read or listen to. This is up my alley. Uh, I do read a lot of nonfiction, and I do have a checkered history with this company at the same time. I first heard about Blinkist in 2016. I remember where I was when I listened to my first Blink. I was in Darwin on Smith Street at the gym. And I thought, eh, not for me. I'm a purist. I don't want anyone to do my reading for me. You shouldn't take shortcuts with that kind of stuff. Then in 2019, the, con- the company contacted me about sponsoring the podcast. And eventually I got cold feet and said, now, nah, for the same reason, no one should do your reading for you. That was July 2019. And then I actually started using the free subscription they gave me as a perk during the negotiation process. And eventually I worked it out. I worked out how to hack Blinkist. You see, I was thinking about it all wrong. It's not a substitute for books. It helps you decide which books to read. It's kind of like the Amazon Look Inside feature or the Kindle Sample feature that let you preview a book, see whether the author's writing entices you, whether the ideas are of interest. Except with those features, you can only generally see the beginning of the book, usually the introduction, so it's not always clear what the author's core thesis is. Because after all, the cost of reading, as one of my podcast guests once reminded me, isn't the sticker price on the book, it's the hours of opportunity cost spent reading it. And you need to know before going in whether it's worth your time. Imagine you've got a very smart friend who reads all the great nonfiction books in the world, and before you commit the time and money to reading a particular book, you check with your friend, is this worth reading? And they give you an intelligent but concise summary of the whole thing, Blinkist is that friend. Of course, there's no substitute for reading the actual book and understanding the author's argument in all of its detail. But in deciding what to read, don't judge a book by its cover, use Blinkist. You can get 25% off an annual subscription and one week's free premium trial by going to my landing page, www.blinkist.com slash swagman. You're listening to the Jolly Swagman Podcast. Here's your host, Joe Walker. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, swagmen and swagettes. Welcome back to the show. Why is gossip the typical topic of conversation from campsites to the halls of parliaments? Why is antisocial a pejorative term? Why do returned soldiers often report that their love for their brothers-in-arms was more intense than for their own wives? Why are English soccer fans almost as passionate? Why do religions exist? Why are we so groupish? I recently ran a Twitter poll where I asked people the question, which scientist has most directly influenced your understanding of evolution? There were 131 respondents, 46% said Charles Darwin, 31% said Richard Dawkins, and 2% said David Sloan Wilson, my guest for this episode. Now, that shouldn't really surprise you. Darwin obviously founded the theory of evolution by natural selection, and Dawkins is influential due to his popular writings. In fact, my impression is that most well-read people get their understanding of evolution mostly from Dawkins' best-selling book, The Selfish Gene, which first hit shelves in 1976 and has since sold over a million copies. 
the selfish gene eloquently crystallized the notion that genes, or combinations of genes, because of their immortality, were the unit of natural selection. Genes were replicators, and we organisms were their vehicles. Despite the book's ambiguous title, Dawkins did not mean to say that selfish genes make thoroughly selfish people. As he explained it in his later book, River Out of Eden, quote, There are occasions when genes may maximize their selfish welfare at their level by programming unselfish cooperation or even self-sacrifice by the organism at its level. But group welfare is always a fortuitous consequence, not a primary drive. This is the meaning of the selfish gene, end quote. I think the prevalence of selfish gene theory owes at least in part to the celebrity and literary flair of some of its major proponents, Richard Dawkins, Stephen Pinker, Matt Ridley. But you may be surprised to know that it no longer represents the consensus view among evolutionary biologists. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why I've been champing at the bit to share this podcast episode with you. You see, there's a new idea as to how we got here. Actually, it's not so much a new idea as a revival. The new consensus comes from an unlikely place, an idea that was considered dead and buried only a few decades ago, group selection. Group selection says that groups or tribes can be and were units of natural selection too. Now, nobody doubts that some groups survive better than others, but the relevant question here is can differential group survival drive evolution in the same way as differential individual survival does. This wasn't always such a controversial question. In fact, in his book, The Descent of Man, in chapter five, Charles Darwin himself made a first nascent pass at the idea of group selection. I quote, a tribe, including many members who, from possessing in a high degree the spirit of patriotism, fidelity, obedience, courage, and sympathy, were always ready to aid one another and to sacrifice themselves for the common good would be victorious over most other tribes, and this would be natural selection, end quote. But after Darwin's exposition, things started to go off the rails. Biologists began to see, for the good of the species, behaviours everywhere in the natural world. Fuzzy thinking predominated and rigour fell apart. This all culminated publicly in a 1962 book called Animal Dispersion in Relation to Social Behaviour by Vera Wynne Edwards. In the book, Wynne Edwards argued that populations of animals, for example, rookeries, can be self-calibrating to protect their habitats or food sources from over-exploitation. In Wynne Edwards' words, quote, the interests of the individual are actually submerged or subordinated to the interests of the community as a whole, end quote. This fuzzy for the good of the species thinking was finally slapped down by George C. Williams, the great evolutionary biologist, in 1966 in his famous book, Adaptation and Natural Selection. There are two common objections to group selection. The first is that groups can't be replicators in the same way that genes are. It's incoherent to think of them as such. And the second is known as the free rider problem. The free rider problem says that selfless groups would be relentlessly undermined by selfish members, and those members would eventually have more offspring and perpetuate their selfish genes. The free rider problem therefore implies that group selection is inherently self-defeating. By the 1960s, group selection had been, it seemed, irredeemably discredited. And so, when the final triumphant nail in the coffin came in the form of the selfish gene in 1976, Dawkins could announce that, quote, the group selection theory now commands little support within the ranks of those professional biologists who understand evolution, end quote. By the 1980s, one evolutionary bigwig said to a graduate student that, quote, there are three ideas that you do not in invoke in biology, Lamarckism, the phlogiston theory, and group selection, end quote. And then along came our guest, David Sloan Wilson. Actually, David argued in 1994, group selection is not a dichotomous alternative to gene or individual level selection, but sits on top of it in a framework known as multi-level selection. During our evolutionary history, natural selection happened on multiple levels, in different ratios, depending on the circumstances. So there's a tug of war between different levels of selection. For example, during a famine bottleneck or during an, a bloodthirsty intertribal conflict, 
more cooperative groups probably fared better, and so natural selection was stronger at the group level. The group was a vehicle, to use Dawkins's language, for pro-social genes. Multi-level selection is well summarized by the maxim of Edward Wilson's, uh, exposed in his book, The Meaning of Human Existence, that, quote, selfish members win within groups, but groups of altruists best groups of selfish members, end quote. Today, the tide of opinion has turned on the question of group selection. To be sure, the old guard seems determined to go down with their ship. Stephen Pinker calls group selection a scientific dust bunny. Matt Ridley, in his book The Origins of Virtue, said it was an edifice without foundation. And Dawkins, reviewing Edward Wilson's book The Social Conquest of Earth, which relies on group selection, said this is not a book to be tossed lightly aside. It should be thrown with great force, end quote. But a 2014 survey by William Jaworski and two co-authors found that 175 evolutionary anthropologists were receptive to group selection. And while a majority said their mentors leaned towards kin selection, 55% regarded multi-level selection as superior to the theory of kin selection as an explanation of human sociality. If this uprising happened without your knowledge, it can all be traced back to one man, my guest, David Sloan Wilson, probably the most important evolutionary biologist you have never heard of. Dave is the guy who almost single-handedly revived a dead theory. Dave is the guy who burst into George C. Williams' office as a graduate student and said, I'm going to change your mind on group selection. That was the George C. Williams, the guy Dawkins said he was heavily influenced by, the guy who wrote Adaptation and Natural Selection. He offered Dave a postdoc on the spot. Dave is also the guy who then went to convince Edward Wilson, the towering Harvard professor and world's foremost expert on ants, to sponsor a paper titled A Theory of Group Selection and eventually converted Ed to the cause. Dave is the guy who moral psychologist John Haidt called one of the most important evolutionary biologists of all time. Haidt also had this to say about Dave, quote, It's rare for an academic to be able to look at a major field like biology and point to its history and say, you see that major turning point there? I did that. And that's what David did. That's what David can say. End quote. Dave is the guy who's probably most directly influenced my understanding of evolution. So how did he achieve this major coup in this major field of biology? Well, this episode tells Dave's story. Of course, groupishness and prosociality don't require group selection as an explanation. But we humans are oddly groupish. Sometimes we do things for the good of the group, even when they're not seen or witnessed. We're probably what biologists call a eusocial species. That's spelled E-U-S-O-C-I-A-L and includes bees and termites, naked mole rats. We are, to use John Height's metaphor, 90% chimp and 10% bee. And once you understand multi-level selection, a lot of our odd groupish behaviours are suddenly rendered in a new light. It changes how you view human nature, and it changes how you think we should structure our societies. So, if your learning of evolution stopped when you put down the selfish gene, this podcast is for you. Alternatively, if you're new to the topic, this episode is as good a place as any to start, because Dave indulges me by running through some foundational concepts at the beginning of the conversation. Without much further ado, please enjoy my chat with David Sloan Wilson. David Sloan Wilson, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Happy to be here. I'm very excited to speak with you because of your monumental achievements in the field of evolutionary biology. And for a while there, you were like a lone voice mm. clamoring in the wilderness. And those were the 70s when it was almost token to announce your group loyalty, I suppose, at the beginning of an evolutionary biology paper and say that, no, I'm not invoking group selection here. <laughs> and Yes, that's right. Uh, group loyalty to not invoking group selection. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Very ironic. But fast forwarding 40 or so years, and it's now commonplace to acknowledge your ideas and multi-level selection, or at least the principle of equivalence, which we'll speak about later. So 
in this conversation, I want to learn how a, a somewhat un or under appreciated profit morphed into an appreciated one. And we're going to start with your background before moving into your career. And then we'll weave in some of your ideas on how humans evolved, how we should think about religion, and what all this means for how we structure our societies and our economies moving into the 21st century. So I'm very much looking forward to this. And the first question I want to ask relates to your childhood. Your father was a famous novelist, Sloane Wilson. I uh, wrote, wrote two very popular books, The Man in the Grey Flannel Suit, which was published in 1956, and A Summer Place, which was published in 1958. Uh, I, I read The Man in the Grey Flannel Suit. Uh, in preparation for this interview, or well, not not the whole book, just parts <laughs> okay. of it, um, which was probably his most famous novel. And it was just so engrossing. It's describing a suburban family, uh, probably borrows from parts of his own life, but it just sucks you in. You know, the, the trials and tribulations and vicissitudes of this family, the vase thrown against the wall that leaves the... the qu- yeah, with the, a question mark. The, the question, question mark, mark yeah. Sh- yeah, shaped crack that our friends are sort of inquiring about at a dinner party. And it just reminded me how much I miss fiction um, since I've been reading nonfiction exclusively for the last four years. <laughs> which, uh, which of his books do you like the most? Or d- do you even like his books? Well, I do like his books. <laughs> um, I mean, he was... Uh, he put his... Pulse, his finger on the pulse twice uh, with the man in the gray flannel suit. That was uh, after World War II and all those soldiers coming back and joining this weird corporate army, basically. That's what the gray flannel suit is. And so he put his pulse on that. And then with the summer place, he put his pulse on changing sexual mores in the 1960s. That story is about two uh, adults who... uh, had a romance when they were teenagers and went their separate ways, uh, married separate people, both became unhappy in marriage, and then meet again when they both have teenage children and they resume their affair. And And back then, that was shocking. I mean, that could be just destroy your reputation if you had a extramarital affair back then. And then their two children have an affair. So that is the um, the narrative of, um, of uh, Summer Place. So... Um, so, yeah, and he wrote uh, other books, uh, and among my favorites, there was one called Ice Brothers, which relates his experience in World War II uh, as a captain of a, a Coast Guard supply ship uh, in the Greenland, uh, Greenland um, a patrol. So my dad was a great novelist. And he achieved fame in 1956 with The Man in the Grey Flannel Suit, which would have put you at about seven years old. How did his fame affect you as a child? The story I tell about myself is that, that um, I, well, he was, he was like uh, both by his personality and by his stature as a best-selling novelist, he was the center of attention wherever he went. He trumped everything. He trumped pedigree. He trumped wealth. Uh, wherever he went, he was the center of attention. And I could not help but notice that. And I think that all offspring, maybe maybe sons more than daughters, I don't know, but uh, your relationship to your parent, you see yourself basically as this is something you have to match. It's like it's like a benchmark. And and in my case, that was like climbing Mount Everest or being asked to. <laughs> so that was that was intimidating. And uh, I think kids solve that problem in a number of ways. In my case, the story I tell about myself is that I decided to do something that he could respect but could not understand. <laughs> that would be a scientist. And, and do you know I succeeded admirably? <laughs> he respected what I did, uh, very proud of me, and actually never really understood very well what, um, what uh, I did. But I think that uh, I certainly inherited, maybe culturally, not genetically, or maybe both, yeah. a love of writing. And so I take writing very seriously. And as soon as I saw that evolution could say something about the human condition, uh, then that in some ways brought out the novelist in me. Because what novelists do, of course, is they try to understand the human condition. Uh, My father did it through the lens of his personal experience. Uh, 
And now I saw that I could do it uh, through the lens of a theory, evolutionary theory. Uh, but I could reflect upon the length and breadth of, of, uh, of humanity. And so that was very attractive to me. Uh, and so uh, I think that um, uh, I, was, I came of age as a graduate student just when E.O. Wilson, we'll be talking about him, published Sociobiology. And Sociobiology was uh, celebrated as a triumph uh, uh, for the study of animal behavior, but the final chapter on humans um, created a storm of, of uh, controversy. Basically, that's a place marker that in 1975, it was not acceptable, it was taboo to study humans from an evolutionary perspective, to say that somehow we can take the same theory that applies to all other species and apply it to our own species was not allowed back then, at least among many people in the in the humanities. So that was actually the same year I got my PhD. Uh, but for me, it was alluring, not not uh, not threatening. So I, I, in some ways, I was I was uh, at the vanguard of the post sociobiology generation. Yeah. And I want to ask you about that in more detail. I've asked you about your father. What was your mother like? My mom was a housewife and a, a very nurturing person. Uh, both my mom and dad were not religious at all. My mom would call herself agnostic. My dad was a skeptic. He loved to poke fun at religion and its hypocrisy. Uh, but they were nevertheless very uh, highly moral. And so if you read my father's books, you'll see that all the characters are trying to do well by each other. They might be failing at that, but they're trying to do well by each other. And I think that also explains perhaps why when I became a, a graduate student and I started to encounter this idea that uh, everything that evolves must be selfish, the idea that something is genuinely nice, genuinely altruistic, uh, why can't that be a product of uh, evolution? So I think the, the selfish gene concept was was uh, something that offended my sensibilities. Uh, I thought it was important to be nice, and surely it should be possible to explain niceness at face value without without calling it selfish. So uh, there was another case in which, uh, when many people were running away from group selection, um, I ran towards it. And another story I tell about myself is that because my father was very famous, then I wanted to be famous too, and <laughs> and um, what what better way to 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 um, uh, make your reputation than to showing that that uh, that theory of group selection, which everyone had rejected, in fact, could be revived. And so uh, I ran towards group selection rather than away from it, in part because I wanted I wanted to make my name. <laughs> So you were raised agnostic, and you would now describe yourself as atheist? I was raised agnostic slash atheist. Dad would, my dad would call himself an atheist. Uh -huh. uh, and now I certainly do describe myself as an atheist. I'm a true blue methodological naturalist, you might say. Yeah. Um, I feel that um, everything about religion can be explained as a human construction as a human construction. And so, yes, I am an atheist. Yeah. So I was, I was raised Catholic, but I'm now an atheist. So we had uh, yeah. probably radically different experiences in that regard. And that actually leads me to a, another question I want to ask about your childhood, uh, the final kind of childhood background question. And that is you were sent to boarding school for high school. And that must yeah. have been a very yeah. formative experience. I went to boarding school as well uh, for my last two years of high school. And for me, it fostered a love of being in and living in communities. We would, you know, ch would cheer as a whole school at the sport on the weekend, sing in the choir. Um, and when you do communal activities like that, you really feel a part of something larger than yourself. Uh, did, did you have a similar experience at boarding school? Did it inform your appreciation of human communities? Uh, absolutely. So uh, to elaborate on that, that's an important point. So to elaborate on it a little bit, um, my my folks were not happy in their marriage, and so they got divorced when I was uh, 11. And before that, 
uh, when I was 13. When I was 11 is when I got sent to boarding school. Mm -hmm. And my mom said, I don't remember it myself, but my mom said that I was following my father around saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So evidently I was taking uh, taking the problems of their marriage uh. onto my little shoulder, onto my little shoulders. And so um, uh, she thought it was time to, that wasn't very healthy. And so she sent me to this boarding school, which by luck or by her wisdom was the most amazing boarding school you have ever seen. It was located in the Adirondack Mountains, which is a wilderness area of uh, New York State. And it uh, it had the principles of uh, basically a small village-like uh, community. And so it offered this, this community that you're talking about and it, to an extraordinary degree. And there was just saturated with the outdoors. Uh, there was uh, a working farm. So, uh, so uh, you know, I, we have horses and cows and pigs and, and chickens that the students took care of. The students did all the maintenance. So there we were sweeping the floors and doing kitchen duty in addition to our, um, in addition to our uh, uh, studies. The adults were called by their first name. Uh, it just went on and on. So it was the, the, living embodiment of a small, nurturing, egalitarian community. And it was absolutely uh, transformative. Um, I feel blessed. And when you say that uh, uh, you had a great experience, I, I'm, I'm happy about that. I think boarding schools are a mixed bag that way. Yeah. And, and that many boarding schools uh, actually are um, are very problematic because they they don't offer that community you might say they're hierarchical think of the think of the british boarding school model uh which can be very nasty uh places and uh as it turned out that school only went to the eighth grade and so come to uh i needed to go to another school in the ninth grade i picked one that i thought was just like the first one uh, but no, uh, uh, possibly because uh, because there was just adolescents rather than younger kids, um, and also because it had a lack of structure. And this this points out a, I think another general point is that in order for a community to be strong and and nurturing, uh, it cannot lack structure. Uh, there has to be some sense in which misbehavior is is um, is prohibited monitored and something is done about it if you misbehave if uh, if a uh, if a community lacks that then you're going to get um, multiple forms of disruptive self-serving um, uh, behaviors and so that second school because it lacked that kind of structure they came into a kind of a lord of the flies society with cliques that were you know there wasn't physical violence but there was uh, there was uh, lots of psychological violence, lots of drugs and stuff like that. Uh, uh, so, uh, so uh, when it comes to communities, then uh, it really they must have the right ingredients to offer that that nurturing environment. So I'm I'm happy to know that yours did. It did, yeah, and I agree. I think boarding school it can kind of either be swiss family robinson or lord of the flies it's a fine line but it all depends on the <laughs> the way they're structured and controlled but really there's a take-home message here because that applies to all groups of all kinds yeah. so what we just said about boarding schools applies to any kind of group we'll get we'll get back to that yeah let's... all groups in order to be cooperative units must have certain design features and when they lack them then they become like the lord of the flies yeah We'll get back to that. And that refers, I guess, to Eleanor Ostrom's core design principles. Yep. Now, Dave, I want to ask you about how you first encountered the theory of natural selection. And for me, natural selection is one of those elegantly tautological ideas that has so much explanatory power. I, I often think... I can't remember where I first heard this, but you can think of the power of an idea as being how much it explains divided by how much it assumes. 
And Dan Dennett once called natural selection the best idea that anyone ever had. Maybe that's going slightly too far, but I, I certainly wouldn't call it hyperbole either. And I'd love to know, do you remember the, the moment you first fell in love with the idea such that you decided it was worthy of building an intellectual career around? Was it a moment or was it a gradual process? Well, it happened... Uh... In a way, it happened in my sophomore year in college. Uh, throughout my upbringing, I, because I did have a lot of outdoors, then um, I, I, I love being outdoors. I love studying animals and things like that. Um, and so I did that even before I went to college. By the time I got to college, I was undecided as to whether I should go into philosophy, music, or biology. And by the first year of college, I swung in the direction of biology. And it was at that point that um, evolution just came very naturally to me. Uh, I've written elsewhere that uh, I, I, I read Ernst Marr's Animal Species and Evolution, which is an 800-page tome, mm. uh, in, a, in a week. <laughs> so uh, it was just an idea that I, that, um, that I took to like a duck to... Uh, like a duck to water. I did have a, I was not a good student. I went to, uh, um, all of my schools were my safeties, basically. I applied to the best schools and was rejected by all of them and and then went to my so-called safety schools, although those turned out to be very good. And at the University of Rochester, I I did poorly in my lecture classes, but I was lucky to, to um, to uh, work in the laboratory of a, a, a professor named Conrad Istock. And once I was basically in somebody's laboratory and operating in graduate student mode, there's such a difference between undergraduate education and graduate education. There's a night and day difference. Uh, and actually, undergraduate education should be like graduate education. There's no excuse for undergraduate education other than just the need to teach students in mass numbers. But once I was in a lab capable of doing my own inquiry, that's where I, that's where I um, uh, thrived and uh, just began soaking up uh, 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 evolution and basically fun functioning like a graduate student uh, in my uh, starting in my sophomore year in college. People who aren't familiar with the theory, tell us the, the three conditions required for natural selection. Well, you said it nicely that the ratio of what it assumes and what it explains, is that how you put it? Yeah. Yeah, so three ingredients to the theory of natural selection. Uh, first, uh, organisms vary in just about everything that could be measured. Number two, those differences make a difference in terms of survival and reproduction. And number three, uh, spring tend to resemble their parents. Darwin didn't know why, but he did know that. <laughs> and so um, put those three ingredients together, and uh, you have your conclusion that uh, populations do not remain constant over time. They change, and, uh, and uh, uh, traits that adapt them, contribute to their survival and reproduction, accumulate in the population. And so it's by this process that organisms become well-adapted to their environments. It's that simple. And should we think about natural selection and evolution as synonymous terms? There is a big difference. Evolution you can define broadly as change, and natural selection is one process of change, but there are others. So drift is also a process of change. You can have differences. You can, let's say that you have differences, things that you can measure that don't make a difference. Um, so they don't stay the same. Uh, just chance will cause them to to um, uh, change in their in their uh, frequency. Then there's a whole bag of other things, byproducts, and and um, you know a trade is not an atomistic uh, entity. A trade is a, is a result of development. It's it's linked to other traits, and and so uh, and so uh, you. It's, it's not as if each and everything you can measure in an organism. Uh, has or requires a separate adaptive uh, adaptive uh, explanation. So natural selection is uh, certainly the centerpiece 
of, of Darwin's theory of evolution, but evolution will always be a, a broader category than natural selection. Mm -hmm. So evolution evolves by a number of mutual processes like random drift, uh, byproducts like spandrels, but the most important one for us to understand, at least for this conversation, is evolution by natural selection. The reason that it has a special status is because you can reason on the basis of natural selection in a way that uh, doesn't require any knowledge of the physical makeup of the organism. The way I often state this is in, in a class, works every time. So uh, picture a desert, a standard desert, and I'm going to ask you the question, what color are most of the species in the desert? And of course, everyone says brown. And then why would that be? Why would that be? Well, unless you're a creationist, then... Uh, when you unpack that, um, actually, um, individuals in the desert vary in their coloration, but the ones that blend in are the ones that survive and, and reproduce. How, how about a white desert? Some deserts have white sand. How about a black desert? Some deserts have black sand. So what are you doing is you are actually making a very intelligent guess, which turns out to be true, about the properties of organisms without needing to know anything about their physical makeup, not their genes, not their exteriors, nothing. Because what natural selection does, to the degree that the physical makeup of organisms results in heritable variation, that's the degree to which it becomes a malleable clay, which is molded by environmental forces. So it's on the basis of the environment that you predict the properties of the organism, not the basis of their physical makeup. So this this provides what I call a third way of thinking. Before natural selection thinking, you only had two ways to explain something. It's physical makeup or some theological explanation. And so I think the true significance of natural selection is just that, is that it provides a way of understanding the properties of organisms without needing to know anything about their physical makeup. And that makes it a holistic explanation. I hope we actually get to the distinction between reductionism and holism. Reductionism says the only way to understand something is to take it apart and to study its parts. Holism says there's the parts permit the whole to have its properties, but they do not cause the whole to have its properties. That's the quintessential holistic statement. And do you know natural selection thinking says exactly that, is that uh, basically uh, um, uh, natural selection, what, what the properties of organisms are molded, not by um, the parts, the physical makeup of the organism permits the uh, organism to have its properties, but th those properties are caused by the environmental forces. This is sometimes called downward causation, downward causation. So it's it really maps very nicely onto the reductionism holism distinction and provides a basis for holistic thinking, which is rock solid, scientifically uh, uh, justifiable. Mm -hmm. I, I want to ask you another question about your time as a student, Dave. You've mentioned Ernst Mars book, Animal Species and Evolution, and you mentioned Ed Wilson's book, Sociobiology. Were there any other life-changing books you read while you were at college, or are those the only two in that sort of category? Um, well, I, I did enter school, even as an undergraduate student, when uh, at the moment that group selection had been rejected. Mm. And so I actually, do, I actually don't remember whether I read Wynne Edwards' book, Animal uh, Dispersion and, and um, Evolution, uh, cover to cover. But it was definitely in the air. So even as a undergraduate student, I had encountered Wynne Edwards and uh, his rejection. Uh -huh. I also am not sure, I don't think I read G.C. Williams' Adaptation and Natural Selection, which came out in 1966. Mm. Uh, um, so, but these things were also in the air. So my first encounter with 
with group selection was, uh, um, and when Edwards was when I was an undergraduate student. And my first kind of effort to show how group selection could work was uh, actually my undergraduate thesis. Mm. Let me just elaborate a little bit, actually. Please. As, uh, get a little bit more specific. So when Edwards uh, uh, speculated many times about group selection, for one of them was he tried to explain vertical migration in, in zooplankton. So zooplankton, uh, the adults uh, migrate diurnally. Uh, they go down into the depths during the day. This is probably to avoid predation. So the, 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 the young zooplankton, because they're small, stay up in the surface. Uh, the adults uh, go down deep. Uh, when Edwards interpreted this as a kind of form of mass parental care, that the adults were collectively leaving the food rich zone in order to provide food for their offspring. Um, this probably isn't true, but I took it as my challenge. And uh, what's so interesting about uh, zooplankton, as I learned, is that even though you'd think that in an aquatic or marine environment like that, uh, mm -hmm. surely everything should be well mixed, right? <laughs> what could be, what could be better mixed than an ocean? <laughs> but as it, as it turns out, the distributions of plankton in the ocean are amazingly patchy. Patchy. If you actually sample zooplankton, either vertically or horizontally, you find that they're patchy. And this is because the, the many currents and, and the waves and so on actually have a way of aggregating. They don't just disperse. Yeah. So, so uh, the, and of course, group selection is all about, uh, there has to be groups, but basically there has to be multiple groups and they have to vary. Mm -hmm. And danged if, um, when you think about patchiness in the ocean, that the the uh, ocean provides perhaps the kind of patchiness that might be um, uh, enable a group selection process. So, for example, with currents, you can imagine that the adults migrate um, uh, down into the deeper water, um, and when they come up again, probably they're horizontally separated from their own offspring, right? Mm because of all the different waves at different the currents at different levels and stuff like that. So if the adults want to segregate themselves horizontally from their offspring, all they'd have to do is migrate vertically and that would be, that would be accomplished. So there was actually a logic to Win Edwards theory. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what I worked out as a um, undergraduate student with yeah. very primitive computer simulations and stuff like that. And that was in your second year at college, right? My third or fourth year in third college, yeah. Year. Okay. Fascinating. Well, now that now you've brought up group selection, we, we probably should speak about it because there's some people who, who, who won't be following what it actually means. And I'm actually going to define it very carefully with you, with your help, Dave. And I thought we could we could start by actually discussing what group selection is not then move to the intellectual history of group selection, and then finally get your sort of elevator pitch for multi-level selection. So let's begin by discussing what group selection is not. And I can think of at least three misconceptions. I'll go into each and get your comment, and then you can add anything I've missed. The first uh, and most casually incorrect idea of group selection is the one that George C. Williams picked up on in, in the book you just mentioned, Adaptation and Natural Selection, the one published in 1966. And he, he highlighted the fact that sometimes the term is redundantly used to refer to an individual trait that just happens to be shared by members of a group. And he famously gives the example of a, the original quote is a fleet herd of deer, but let's just say a fast herd of deer. And a fast herd of deer is really just a herd of fast deer. What did he mean by that? So, uh, yeah, that's an important uh, distinction. So imagine that there's no social behaviors at all. There's just slow deer and fast deer. There's no social behavior at all. Nevertheless, they're clustered into different groups. Yeah. And so that means that some of these groups are faster than others just by virtue of their... Uh, their composition. 
Uh, uh, William said correctly, no group selection is going on here. Um, there's a difference between groups, but that's not group selection. Now let's contrast that to something that is group selection. Okay. Uh, let's say, for, let's say, for example, that um, um, when uh, adults, uh, a predator comes, adults form a circle, and they protect their young within the circle. Okay. Uh -huh. Now we have something where if you're, or I'll give you a better one, which is a real example, a territorial defense in in um, in lions. So imagine a lion pride, females, you know, with six or seven females. Uh, there's a territorial threat. Another pride is trying to infringe on their territory. Uh, you have to fight, right? And so what happens if there's some individuals that hang back? Then they're not their their fitness is going to be greater than the the ones that that fight, at least within the pride. So now you have a social behavior. The difference between a social behavior and a non-social behavior is a non-social behavior, like running fast, only influences your fitness. It doesn't influence anyone else's fitness. Uh -huh. A social behavior influences not only your own fitness, but the fitness of others around you, the fitness of others around you. And so bravery in a fight versus cowardice in a fight, that's consequential not just for you, but for the others in your vicinity. And so group selection is about social behaviors. It's not about non-social behaviors. It. Group selection makes no sense for non-social behaviors. So that was the distinction that, that um, Williams was, uh, uh, was making in, uh, in that distinction between okay. the herd of fleet deer and the yep. fleet herd of deer. So a trait shared by a group did not evolve by group selection if the trait only affects individuals and it's not a social trait. Right. Okay. Next thing, group selection is not. Talk about for the good of the group thinking and animals that people might perceive to be sacrificing themselves for their species. Well, I want to say, in fact, I do say <laughs> that um, group selection is about traits that are for, for the good of the group. That's the quintessential group selection uh, uh, question. But na how do we na explain? sorry to interrupt, naive group selection is is a little bit broader than than what you think to be the correct form of for the good of the group thinking. Am I right? Well, I want to say that naive group selection is like a... Um, 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 you know, they say that, you know, uh, history gets told by the victors. Uh -huh. And so in the rejection of group selection, okay. then, then they started to talk about naive group selection. Um, so I think we should first talk about, you know, what group selection is and then talk about what might qualify as naive uh, group selection. Is that okay? Yeah. Go for it. So I think that uh, group selection begins with Darwin, and Darwin, at the beginning, thought that his theory of natural selection could explain all aspects of design that had been attributed to a creator. Uh -huh. But gradually he realized that that was not the case, and the exception were all of the traits associated with morality and virtue, everything that we regard as morally virtuous. I play this game with audiences all the time. I ask them, and I'll ask you, um, just describe for me the morally perfect individual. Uh, what, what are the adjectives that would be used to describe the morally perfect individual? Altruistic, pro-social, doesn't lie, uh, sacrifices for the group, kind, generous. Yeah, that's right. 100% of the time you get that answer. Now, if you think of that, those social behaviors from an evolutionary perspective, of course, what's the alternative to these things? So um, what's, the, what, what's the opposite of the morally perfect individual? Spit out some adjectives for, for evil incarnate. Selfish, thieving, lying, stealing, yeah, okay. cheating. Yeah, okay. Murdering. So just imagine it. So just imagine a Darwinian contest between 
these two classes of traits. And what you find is, is that the virtuous traits do not have the advantage. They are inherently vulnerable to the traits that we associate with, uh, with evil. And if we just state that a little more formally, is that doing something for others or for a group as a whole inherently requires time, energy, and risk on the part of the individual actor. Mm -hmm. And for those individuals that are not virtuous, they accept those social benefits without providing them. And so therefore, in any group that contains more pro-social and less pro-social individuals, the advantage goes to the less pro-social individual. Darwin said, it is true that the morally virtuous individual is not more fit compared to someone else within their own within their own group. And so Darwin's theory did not have the capacity to explain all of the behaviors that we associate as virtuous. And those behaviors, of course, are for the good of the group, for the good of others, and for the good of the group. It's those traits that Darwin could not explain. Mm -hmm. On the basis of on the basis of competition among individuals that are socially interacting with each other, and so this was a dilemma of the first rank for him. How could he explain these behaviors? And the answer was not far to seek. It is actually pretty obvious that although at the most local level, at the level of the group of of, of individuals that are socially interacting with each other that selfishness beats altruism, but a group of altruists will robustly outcompete a group of selfish individuals. And so as soon as you imagine that the evolving population consists of multiple social groups, tribes, as Darwin put it, or he also used the word community, mm. but uh, as soon as we begin to think of the evolving population of consisting of multiple uh, groups, then we can explain the evolution of altruism and, and all of its all of its forms. Any trait that's for the good of the group will be positively selected by between group competition. So that was why Darwin needed the theory of group selection in order to explain this very important class of traits that are for the good of the group. That was the origin of group selection theory and the thread that continued through through the whole history of the of the subject. We could follow that thread all the way through to the first the birth of population genetics. So the fathers of population genetics were Ronald Fisher, J.B.S. Haldane, and Sewell Wright. These were the people that put the theory of evolution on a mathematical foundation, uh, uh, basically building models of Mendelian inheritance. And they had a lot of work to do just to build the whole mathematical framework for studying evolution. Against that background, this particular problem of altruism, as strange as it might seem, did not loom very large. It was not like a, a central issue. There was too much else that they, they had to do. But nevertheless, each one considered the problem briefly. And in all cases, they basically recapitulated Darwin's thinking. What do we, how do we explain a trait that is good for the group, but selectively disadvantageous within groups? The only way we can do it is by positing uh, a multi-group population and some sense in which, in which the more altruistic groups contribute more to the uh, gene pool than the less altruistic groups. Each did so in a different way with different specific conceptions of of um, of groups. Now, against that background, now we can get to naive group selection, okay. because not not all biologists were uh, as discerning as Darwin, and many of them didn't know much about population genetics. So you have to understand that the kind of the integration of the different branches of biology. Today we have like. Um, ecology, evolution, behavior, those are fused, we call that EEB. Um, obviously, population genetics is part of this integration and so on. But back then, in the first decades of the 
20th century when population genetics was just getting started and was mathematical, then there were all kinds of naturalists and biologists who, who studied nature, uh, which didn't know anything about that. And uh, quite a few of them thought about, thought that behaviors could evolve for the good of the group uh, without requiring special circumstances. That basically natural selection produces adaptations at all levels, for the individual, for the group, uh, for the ecosystem. Uh, so they were not very discerning about the special conditions that were uh, required. Uh, in retrospect, we can call that naive group selection. And yes, there were naive group selectionists. Okay. And really what uh, the contribution of G.C. Williams, uh, here's the story of, uh, of, um, of how he wrote adaptation and, and natural uh, selection. He was a, uh, got his Ph.D. at U.C. Berkeley, hmm. and he did receive training in, in uh, um, population genetics. So he was well-trained for his time. And then he did a postdoc at the University of Chicago, this was before when Edwards wrote his book. And he went into a lecture uh, by a termite biologist named um, Alfred Emerson, a very well-known biologist, uh, a termite biologist. And of course, termites are uh, the quintessential superorganism. Uh, today we know that the eusocial insect colonies are definitely units of selection, but Emerson generalized beyond that. He explained, you know, he, he, he thought about all of nature as like a termite colony. And, uh, and this disgusted George Williams. Uh, he said, uh, he left that lecture and he said, if this is biology, I want to do something else, like become a car salesman. <laughs> and so, uh, and so George set about uh, writing a book that critiqued basically this kind of sloppy thinking mm -hmm that behaviors evolved for the good of the group. And it was uh, only while he was writing that book that, uh, that when Edwards published his book. So George's book was not a uh, response to when Edwards' book. Um, uh, they're still spaced four years apart. When Edwards was published in 1962, Williams in 1966. So Williams had plenty of time to kind of add, add when Edwards to the list. Mm -hmm. of, uh, of naive um, uh, group selectionists. But uh, so George, quite properly, was what he was doing, and he himself thought of it this way, was he was kind of trying to educate biologists in population genetics theory mm -hmm. and to cause them to think more rigorously about lots of things, not just, uh, not just uh, uh, group selection. And in the process... He also, um, he also uh, came to the conclusion that uh, not only does group selection require special conditions, but those conditions are so special that it hardly exists at all. Mm -hmm. It could exist in principle, but, but um, in practice, he claimed almost everything could be explained as a product of within-group selection, uh, lower-level selection is almost invariably stronger than higher level selection was the empirical conclusion that he came to. Got it. So that's really what I wanted to bring out in terms of what group selection is not. It's not that sloppy thinking that George Williams reacted to that between group selection easily trumps within group selection. Um, but you gave us some necessary background, so thank you for that. And I think that also leads to another thing group selection is not, which I want to highlight and, and underscore here, which has been implicit in everything you've said, Dave, but I think for people who aren't familiar with evolutionary biology, it's important to point this out. And that is that group selection isn't mutually exclusive with or some sort of alternative framework to gene level selection or individual level selection. Uh, and really what you mean when you say group selection is multi-level selection. Do you just want to make a comment on that? If you think about what we've already said, mm. uh, group, group selection is a series of nested comparisons First, you compare the fitness of individuals within groups, and it's at that level that selfishness beats altruism. Then you compare the 
fitness differences between groups in a multi-group population. That's where altruism beats selfishness. But you're always comparing the fitness of units within the next higher unit, okay? Hmm. Now we can frame shift downward hmm. and we can compare the fitness of genes within individuals. And we have cases such as meiotic drive and certainly cancer in which genes can be more fit than other genes within the same individual. So that would be now uh, extending this, this nested uh, compare, uh, uh, fitness comparisons. Units within higher units. What are the fitness of genes within individuals? What's the fitness of individuals within groups? What's the fitness of groups within uh, a multi-group population? It's in this sense that gene level selection and individual level selection and group level selection are distinct from each other. They're non-overlapping, okay? Now, but there's another sense of gene level selection and individual level selection. Uh, let's say, take a gene that's not a selfish gene in the first sense. Let's take a gene that's, that basically just makes you more fit as an individual and all the other genes within you, okay? So there's no difference in the fitness of genes in this scenario. The gene is benefiting everyone, okay? And nevertheless, it evolves by virtue of the fact that the individual is more fit than other individuals. Now, you can still say that that gene is, is more fit than other genes, all things considered, not within, not within the individual, but all things considered, it, it evolves. Hmm. And anything that evolves is more fit than what doesn't evolve. And so there's a second meaning of selfish genes, not selfish in the sense of more fit than other genes within the same individual, but selfish in the sense of more fit, all things considered, all things considered. And it's here where that concept of gene selfishness, which is Dawkins's concept, overlaps with group selection and with individual level selection. In mm. other words, a trait can evolve by group selection. A gene for altruism can evolve by group selection, but when it does, that gene is more fit than the genes that didn't evolve. And so you can call it selfish just by virtue of the fact that it evolved. So here's where we get into these like different frames of comparison. Mm. And it, it introduces us to the concept of equivalence. Mm. There seems to be different different ways of accounting for evolutionary change. And they're both correct. I mean, they both they both correctly predict what evolves in the in the total population. But you can erroneously treat one as an argument against the other. And that's where all the trouble begins. That's mm -hmm. where um, that that's where um, uh, the confusion starts and was endemic in the 19, with the whole rejection of group selection was a confusion basically of, um, of, this, uh, of this sort. Hmm. I don't know if that's gonna be clear to your readers, to your listeners. <laughs> no, no, it's a very important, no, I, it's I a think, very important point to establish, however. I agree, and I think it will be clear, uh, if not now, then, then momentarily. Let's turn now to when group selection fell out of favor. Tell us about how that happened. The main thing I want to say about that is to uh, is to uh, situate it in very broad cultural cultural uh, terms with what I think is the advent of individualism hmm. as a broad cultural phenomenon. So let me set the stage for this a little bit. If you go back to the uh, um, first half of the 20th century and the 19th century, of course, the idea of society as something which is a, an entity in its own right, which cannot be reduced to lower level processes, not biology, not even psychology, was a very, very common um, idea. Also, the idea that society is an organism in its own right. And Durkheim is somebody that's associated with this. The birth of the whole field of sociology um, established itself as that basically we need to study society on its own uh, 
terms. It just can't be, it just can't be uh, reduced. Uh, that led to a tradition called functionalism, mm. which basically explained cultures and societies on the basis of how well they worked for the group, basically. Um, that was the primary explanation, and you could find it in social psychology and in anthropology and and uh, so on. It uh, it actually was the dominant tradition, but then it fell out of favor for a good reason. What was that reason? It was too axiomatic. It was as if like every feature of a society or culture had to be explained as for the good of the group. And so it deserved to be rejected as too axiomatic, but what replaced it? So what replaced it was uh, often called individualism, and it basically is a commitment to the idea that, w that, uh, that the most fundamental explanation is at the individual level. You do not understand something unless you understand it in terms of individual thoughts and actions. And so this became prominent across disciplines. Uh, in economics, it's called rational choice theory, homo economicus, the rational actor, basically. Economic, the economic profession is, is penetrated by individualism, that we're going to explain economic phenomenon in terms of individual self-interest. It's called, it's called methodological individualism in the, um, in the social sciences. And in everyday life, we have people like Margaret Thatcher saying there's no such thing of society, only individuals and their and their families. So there actually is nothing social other than a consequence of what individuals do in order to um, uh, maximize their utilities or their or their uh, uh, self-interest. Well, isn't it curious that at the same time these things were happening across the board, then that also is when evolution had its individualistic swing mm. and that evolution has decided that uh, really everything has to be explained as a form of lower level selection. Williams called it the theory of individual selection and then Dawkins notched it still further down to a theory of a uh, gene level gene level uh, uh, selection. So in in some ways it seems that that what took place in, in evolution was marching in lockstep with broader cultural trends. And I think that's a very important point to make. We cannot explain what happened in the field of evolution in isolation from what was happening uh, elsewhere. And social historians are needed to explain in detail just what was going on and what was causing what. Hmm. So this this normative worldview of radical individualism, the sort of Ayn Rand view of the world, permeated the sciences, including evolutionary biology, and struck a deep resonance with the idea of individual level selection. Uh, absolutely. And Is that, if we try sorry, to disin Dave, is there anything in the writings of the the genes I view or the individual selectionists that would be evidence for that theory? I think some of these have, you might say, I don't think this was necessarily ideologically driven. Right. I think part of it is is the advent of um, of um, mathematical models. Mm. And because mathematical models, um, almost by definition, are reductionistic and and simplifying, and um, and uh, and are going to be um, individualistic in how they are constructed. There's a cycle that I think I I don't think it's inevitable, but it happens more often than not that. As soon as you think of things mathematically, there's a simplification stage where you build these really simple models. You try to explain as much as you can with them. And then gradually, um, there's things that you cannot explain with those models, and those models become more and more um, more and more um, 
um, complex. Mm -hmm. So you begin like appreciating complexity. You know, nature is a big tapestry. Um, then you try to understand it with mathematical models, and that becomes like simple um, uh, lock of Voltaire equations and and things like that. And then gradually that explains some stuff, but then there's lots left over. And then at the end of the day, you're appreciating complexity again. I mean, just think that the whole study of complex systems, complexity theory, didn't really begin until the 60s or the 70s. Mm. Uh, required compu required computer simulation models, which in turn required you know the the advent of desktop computing and stuff like that. You couldn't actually study complexity uh, until you had uh, widespread uh, access to uh, to uh, uh, to computers, so we have these things. We have these things uh, um, going on, but uh, I mean, I was there, so uh, I can remember. I, let me quote. Let me let me give you two quotes, and one of them is from uh, uh, Brett Weinstein's mentor, Richard Alexander. But just to give you the tenor of the times, yeah. Here's uh, two uh, quotes. Uh, one is from. Uh, Michael Gislin in his book, The Economy of Nature and the Evolution of Sex. And so what you have here is that theorists, the evolutionary theorists were, were actively looking to economics. You know, first came economics, rational choice theory, and then came the evolutionists emulating the economists. That was true for John Maynard Smith, for example, with evolutionary game theory, emulating economic game theory. And so, and at the time, people were so excited because isn't it exciting that our evolutionary models are kind of mapping on to economic models? I mean, the main difference is that economic models talk about utility and we talk about fitness maximization. But other than that, they're the same. That was the kind of the zeitgeist. And so here's a quote from, a notorious quote from Gislin. This was published, I think, in 1974. Um, uh, the economy of nature is competitive from beginning to end. The impulses that lead one animal to sacrifice himself for another turn out to have their ultimate rationale and gaining an advantage over the third. Where it is in his own interest, every organism may reasonably be expected to aid his fellows. Yet given a full chance to act in his own interest, nothing but expediency will restrain him from brutalizing, from maiming, from murdering, his brother, his mate, his parent, or his child. Scratch an altruist and watch a hypocrite bleed. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Now talk about talk about dispassionate science. <laughs> yeah, scientists scientists uh, <laughs> they don't have an extra grind. <laughs> and here's a uh, and here's a quote from uh, Brett Weinstein's uh, mentor Richard Alexander, who, by the way was a great scientist. Um, I think that um, um, although he insisted on seeing things through an individual, individualistic lens, mm. including all of morality, uh, it's not to say that he didn't make contributions. But in any case, here is uh, Alexander, 1987. It's a long time past. In his book, The Biology of Moral Systems, mm. I suspect that nearly all humans believe it is a normal part of the functioning of every human individual now and then to assist someone else in the realization of that person's own interests to the actual net expense of those of the altruist. But this greatest intellectual revolution of the century, in other words, the individualistic perspective in evolutionary biology tells us is that despite our intuitions, there is not a shred of evidence to support this view of beneficence, and a great deal of convincing theory suggests that any such view will eventually be judged false. Mm. So the message here is that although we think that we act on behalf of others and that that could be accepted at face value, actually that's not true, and that the greatest intellectual revolution of the century is to tell us that everything that we associate with morality can be understood as a form of self-interest. Mm. So there you have the individualistic perspective in full swing. And what I find so remarkable is that if we place that against functionalism, if we rejected functionalism for being axiomatic, mm. 
as we should, then individualism of this sort is also axiomatic. We must explain everything as a form of individual self-interest. And I think that what's special about what's happening now with multi-level selection theory and other theories, because we have to um, acknowledge equivalence, is that we now have something which is not axiomatic. We could actually, on a case-by-case -case basis, we could look at some product of evolution and we can say, for example, in this case, it evolved by within-group selection. And so it deserves to be called an individual level adaptation. In that case, it evolved by group selection. It deserves to be called a group level adaptation. You can call it on a case-by-case -case basis. That means it's no longer axiomatic. Hmm. And that is, I think, a very important point to make. Hmm. It's incredible the parallels between where evolutionary theory went wrong and where neoclassical economics went wrong. Like taking macroeconomics, for example, it's not just that it assumes all the units or the, the individual agents in the economy are selfish, utility-maximizing machines, but also it overlooks the emergent phenomena of how they act and interact in groups. Uh, you know, things like conformity, herding, that's the, the psychology of bubbles, which neoclassical economics was just blind to for so long. And, yep, totally, totally. And that's why this parallel history of economics and, well, again, it goes beyond even those two uh, fields. It extends to the social sciences and, um, and so on. And social psychology completely taken over by the individualistic mm. uh, perspective. So it's broader than any of those. But you're absolutely right that, uh, and in this sense, I think uh, uh, evolutionary biology has advanced beyond economic theory. Economic theory is still stuck, very much stuck with uh, individualism, even like behavioral economics, which is certainly advanced over rational choice theory, but it's still individualistic. It's still talking about individuals as now basically being guided by heuristics and biases rather than, rather than um, um, uh, rational choice, but it's still very much an individual level of, of um, description, whereas evolution, to the extent that it embraces multi-level selection theory, now has, has really started to explain phenomenon as uh, a group level uh, adaptations, so mm. including such things as religion, which will be, mm. which will be, which will be getting to. Yeah, I think you make a good point about how even behavioral economics is still grounded in an individual individualistic paradigm. You know, Daniel Kahneman has the metaphor or the two characters of System One and System Two. System One being the fast, intuitive thinking, which results in the biases, and System Two being the slower, more effortful thinking. I often like to hijack that metaphor and talk about system three, which is, you know, the, the social influences between people. That's a totally different category altogether. Exactly. Exactly. The idea that we're more like ant colonies than yeah. we than we have imagined in the past, that's the degree to which the our individual brains evolved in the context of groups so much. Yeah. So much that where, where, to a degree, it's a very careful comparison that you have to make. Um, we're like a, a, an ant in an ant colony. That is, that is true in its own special way yeah. to uh, a remarkable degree. And that is beyond the imagination of many people. Yeah. Or to borrow John Hyatt's metaphor, we're 90% chimp and 10% bee. Yeah. Yeah, I would, uh, I'd, I'd quibble with the proportions, but... Uh, <laughs> but oh, uh, you'd, you'd make it uh, more in favor of the bees? Yeah. Wow. How, what, what percentages would you put on it? I mean, obviously, oh, obviously, uh, obviously it's just a metaphor, but... No, we'll talk about, uh, I think uh, it's on our agenda to talk about Jim Cohen's work um, yeah. and uh, social, social baseline... Uh, theory, but uh, I mean, we could do it now if you want, or we can do it later. But uh, 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 let's let's do it later then, because I want to okay. uh, in in this story, this intellectual history of group selection now swaying back to individual level selection and inclusive fitness, 
beginning with, uh, you know, JBS Haldane and WD Hamilton and George C. Williams. I, I want to rejoin the story where, where you kind of enter the picture, Dave, and you published your first academic article on group selection in 1975, and it was titled A Theory of Group Selection. But there's actually kind of a cool story around that uh, because you, in 1974, you got Ed Wilson, the you know preeminent, uh, towering uh, man at, at Harvard, uh, who, who you know the world expert on uh, on insects uh, and ants, and you had him sponsor the paper. And, and I, I want to ask you about that. And, and I want you to tell us the story of when you burst into George C. Williams' office at Stony Brook, and what happened there. Well, so um, I told you that I kind of tinkered with group selection as an undergraduate student, and that was on zooplankton. Yeah. Uh, I went to graduate school. Once again, my safety. I didn't get into any other college but my safety, Michigan State, which turned out to be a great choice. And uh, I was intending to be a zooplankton ecologist, not studying group selection or vertical migration. I was actually studying issues relating to feeding and and the like. I actually met Ed Wilson the first time uh, at Woods Hole, which is a great marine biological laboratory. I was taking a course in marine ecology, and he was one of the teachers of that course. And so this has nothing to do with group selection. I was studying feeding and copepods, but that was my first encounter with uh, with Ed Wilson was, uh, was there. Anyhow, I was most of the way through my thesis on... Um, um, not group selection, mm. uh, when a paper on vertical migration came out, and it just caused me to dust off my old ideas. And by then, I'd, I'd become a modeler. Not only was I studying zooplankton, but I had become a little bit proficient at, at building mathematical models, very simple algebraic models, nothing sophisticated. Uh, nevertheless, I started to build a model of group selection, uh, that um, suddenly became very general, hmm. uh, way beyond zooplankton. And uh, it was like I immediately understood its significance that uh, here was a quite a general explanation of um, how group selection could um, actually be a strong evolutionary force. So I must have been a bold person because I just um, um, contacted Ed Wilson on the spot and and um, said I wanted to uh, speak with him, and he said yes. He's a he's a uh, very gallant Southern gentleman, um, and is a uh, nurturing of um, of students. And then on my way, I I did visit George Williams at Stony Brook, and I did burst into his office and said, uh, I want to convince you about group. I'm going to convince you about group selection, <laughs> and he did, and he did offer me a postdoc on the spot. Uh, which says something very nice about George. And that actually was the beginning of a lifelong friendship with George C. Williams. Um, this is how science should work at all times, where intellectual adversaries are actually can be the best of, yeah. of friends. And uh, I was already uh, had cultivated a postdoc with someone else at Harvard uh, named Tom Shainer. So I was not about to do a postdoc with uh, with uh, George Williams, and then I went to uh, um, Ed Wilson, and Ed is, of course, a very busy person, and so he had allotted me like a fixed amount of time, and he always shows people his ant lab and stuff like that, so we took a tour of his ant lab at uh, the Museum of Comparative Zoology, and then he sat down in a chair and put me in front of a blackboard, and he said, you have 20 minutes, <laughs> and so I... Uh, I he's talk a, like he's an auctioneer. A hard, he's a hard man. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And uh, and so he agreed to uh, to look at my paper and he sent it out to review and and that it ended up being published uh, in the proceedings of the National Academy of Science. Wow. And then that cre that created a dilemma for my PhD advisor because uh, this paper on group selection had nothing to do with my the rest of my thesis and uh, my PhD advisor. Uh, pre-spirited man named Don Hall decided that if uh, if uh, my PNAS paper was good enough for PNAS in 
and uh, Ed Wilson, it was good enough for a PhD thesis. So uh, that became my entire thesis. Yeah. Uh, how old were you when that paper was published? I would have been 24. Wow, that's crazy. Well done. <laughs> I mean, a lot of a lot of, a lot of people. I mean, uh, that was in part because it was a really generative uh, time. This was the 1973. This was the year. This was the decade where, of course, sociobiology was published. This was the decade where Dobjansky said nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. This was the decade that uh, Tinberg and Lorenz and von Frisch got the Nobel prize for their work. And so what was happening was um, these historically separate fields of ecology, uh, evolution, and behavior were fusing. And it was like the beginning of rock and roll, you might, you might say. I mean, mathematical models were just coming into their own. And so it meant that if a graduate student was like in the middle of this, then there were so many things to discover, so many models to build, so many studies to do. The concept of optimal foraging theory, that you can study foraging as uh, in terms of fitness maximization. How would a predator forage for prey if it was attempting to maximize its energy intake? Let's build an economic model of that. Mm. And this led to predictions that you could test. And, and so the whole kind of um, transformation of uh, of um, of biology, whole organism biology, from a sort of a natural history descriptive typological phase to a predictive phase with models and testing and stuff. That's what I was lucky enough to to uh, to be present for. So I think that you know we know that in many cases there's times when when something big starts, like mm -hmm. rock and roll or and, and the people that are there, they they become the classics. Mm. And then what follows, it becomes a little bit derivative. So uh, I attribute some of this to, to uh, those times, basically. Quite a few, uh, uh, in fact, many people made foundational contributions as graduate students. Yeah. At this point, Dave, I want to quote a couple of sentences from your famous 2007 paper with Ed Wilson, who you eventually uh, converted to the cause and, and co-authored some influential papers with. And I, I just want to quote the way you and Ed define multi-level selection just to solidify the concept for people before asking you about altruism. Would that be okay? Sure. I just think this is a really neat quote. So you and Ed write that quote, natural selection takes place at more than one level of the biological hierarchy. Selfish individuals might outcompete altruists within groups, but internally altruistic groups outcompete selfish groups. This is the essential logic of what has become known as multi-level selection theory, end quote. So that in, an, in, a, in a very tight nutshell is, is multi-level selection. But of course, the, the quintessential battleground for gene level selection versus multi-level selection is altruistic behavior. And I want to ask you a few questions about this. And I thought maybe we should begin by briefly defining what altruism is. And the person who actually coined the term altruism was Auguste Comte. How did he define altruism? Isn't it strange that the word altruism didn't even exist until the mid 18 Hundreds. Uh, that seems shocking. Do you know what word they used before that? I think there were um, words for community and and things like that. Uh, German words for for uh, community, but not uh, 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 altruism. And what uh, what Comte was was trying to do, he was one of the first big thinkers trying to create a whole cosmology that was not religious. Hmm. He called it the, the religion of man. Uh, Herbert Spencer was another person that was trying to basically um, uh, create a cosmology that was not a religious cosmology. 
Hmm. And uh, Comte uh, coined the word altruism in part to contrast it with with um, uh, Catholic thought. And I mean, if you're if you're a Catholic or a Christian, then you do good deeds to go to heaven. It's like a selfish motive to be altruistic. And and uh, so a lot of the motive, and this is true with most religious systems, if you ask what how does the how does the religious cosmology motivate people to be uh, other oriented? It's in part with individual incentives, not just not just uh, an afterlife, but uh, but um, other uh, benefits, uh, including including um, worldly benefits. And so and so, Comte coined altruism as something that was like a more pure motivation, something that was more genuinely other oriented as an end, as an end in itself. So that was uh, roughly the context for, for the word to be, um, for the word to be coined. Got it. Now, how have evolutionary biologists co-opted and, and defined this word? Well, one point to make is that there's two major definitions of altruism and, and which very much need to be distinguished and we're not Originally, the first from multi-level selection is based on a comparison within groups. It's a relative fitness comparison. Hmm. If I do something, if I do something that benefits others or the group as a whole, and that places me at a relative fitness disadvantage, that's altruistic. Just let's say this: let's say I do something that's good for everyone in my group, including me. It gives a fitness benefit of one, and it costs me a little bit, point one. And so that means that my fitness is 0.9 and everyone else's fitness is one. So I've increased my absolute fitness, but I've decreased my relative fitness. That makes me an altruist because when altruism is defined in terms of relative fitness. Now, the other definition of altruism is based on absolute fitness. I'm not an altruist unless I actually benefit someone at some net absolute cost to myself. And so there you have two definition of altruism. And in the example I gave, that example counts as altruistic, according to the first definition, but not according to the second definition. And when Hamilton constructed inclusive fitness theory, it was based on absolute fitness. Mm. So, so the, the, the distinction between inclusive fitness theory and multi-level selection theory, it's hard to compare them because they actually employ different definitions of altruism. We can say that now, but at the time, um, that was like not at all understood. All understood. Call that, you can call that naive. I mean, if we're going to call group selectionists naive for not being sufficiently nuanced about the special conditions, then... We're getting into territory here that were like genuine confusions that required many years, actually, for smart people to sort out. I want to make the point that there's something about group selection that's very subtle. The idea that a trait can, can be selectively disadvantageous in every group where it exists, but still evolve, seems impossible. It's actually called, a, it's a statistical paradox called the Simpson, Simpsons paradox. And it has applications outside of, of uh, evolutionary theory. Mm. So there's something genuinely subtle about, about some of these distinctions that required uh, very smart people quite a lot of time in order to, to work through. But in retrospect, we can look back and we could say, these folks were genuinely confused. That's a crucial distinction, relative and absolute fitness. Absolutely crucial. Yeah. What I want to do now, Dave, is briefly canvas some of the individual selectionist explanations of altruism. And I can identify three. I think this covers the field. We have kin selection, Reciprocal altruism and indirect reciprocity. Does that does that cover the field? 
Uh, let's say so, and then I might add some more later on. But those okay. are certainly when you when you think of the main frameworks that pass as alternatives to to group selection, then those are the main ones. Yes. Great. So just so we know what we're up against, can you give us a, a brief outline of each of those? Let's start with kin selection. Well, in its original formulation, uh, kin selection refers to genealogical kin. Mm. Um, and genes that are identical by descent. And so Hamilton created a model which calculated something called inclusive fitness. It was the effect of an action, not just on the individual, but on all of the genes that are identical by descent in the individual and in the recipient of the action. So let's say that I'm an altruist. I do something. It's uh, negative for me, so I have a cause. It's beneficial for the recipient. Okay. But what's the probability that the recipient has the same gene identical by descent? Um, if it's a non-relative, that probability is zero. If it's a relative, then there is some probability of sharing the gene, which is... Uh, basically proportional to the degree of relatedness. So if it's a if it's a cousin, it's less than a brother. If it's a brother, it's less than an identical twin. If it's an identical twin, you know that the recipient has the same gene as the the um, um, actor. And so Hamilton's rule basically calculates the uh, effect of the behavior um, on the actor, plus the recipient, weighted by the probability, that's what the R coefficient is, the coefficient of relatedness, and it asks the question, when is there a net increase in the altruistic allele? Now, here we have, again, an absolute fitness criteria. When does this behavior increase the net increase of the altruistic allele? Mm. That's not comparative, is it? Mm. So, nevertheless, given certain other assumptions, then that does predict what evolves in the total uh, population. And so now we could say that altruism evolves. Altruism is a form of inclusive fitness maximization. Altruism is actually um, the individual maximizing its own inclusive fitness. So you have permuted altruism to a form of selfishness. Mm -hmm. Got it. So RB is greater than C is kind of like the little, the slogan. Yep, that is the, uh, that is the uh, slogan. And it created a sensation mm. and, was, uh, and was regarded as, a, uh, uh, as an alternative explanation. We don't need group selection now uh, because we can explain um, altruism with inclusive fitness. And at that time, it was confined to genealogical uh, mm. relatives. An important corollary was that in uh, in, in uh, um, some insects with a haplodiploid genetic system, where the females are diploid and the males are haploid, then that creates a extra high degree of relatedness mm. among sisters. And Hamilton used this to explain why it is that uh, most, but not all, because the termites are an exception, um, eusocial insects are. Uh, our hymenoptera have this haplodiploid um, genetic hmm. system. So kin selection explains why altruistic behaviors towards relatives would evolve by gene level selection. But of course, humans are altruistic towards people who aren't related to them in the gene pool. Uh, but the individual selectionists had an answer to that too. Uh, Bob Trivers came along with reciprocal altruism. How did that theory work? And so once again, uh, the idea there is uh, I scratch your back, you scratch mine, uh, yep. is that um, um, altruism can pay if there's a return benefit. So if, now in the case of kin selection, that's not required. A single altruistic act evolves. It's not reciprocated. Um, but the reason it evolves is that the, the, the recipient shares the altruistic genes. So a single act uh, 
increase as the uh, copies of the altruistic mm. gene. Uh, now, if that's not the case, if you're interacting with a non-relative, then the only way for an altruistic act to evolve is for it to be reciprocated, basically. It leads the recipient to um, um, to repay the kindness. It's at that point that you can explain the evolution of altruism among non-relatives. Uh, uh -huh. Now, next we're going to get to indirect reciprocity. Yeah. Uh, so that was Dick Alexander and, in 1987, Brett, Brett Weinstein's mentor. Yep, that's right. That's right. And, I mean, we know that indirect reciprocity exists in human life. It's kind of an intuitive idea. It's just like, you're nice to me, and uh, I'm not nice directly back to you. I'm nice to somebody else. Mm. But somehow some kind of circle uh, exists so that through an indirect route rather than a direct route, if I'm nice to you, somebody's nice to me, not you, but somebody, because everyone's paying it forward. Uh, that's the idea of indirect uh, reciprocity. Mm. So, um, so that's describing it in words. It's here where we can make the point that when you actually model any of these carefully and explicit models, you are making assumptions about groups. With kin selection, you're making assumptions that social interactions are confined to genetic relatives. With, with direct reciprocity, you're making assumptions that a pair of individuals is interacting with each other. A pair is a group. A pair is a, why shouldn't we call a pair a small group? With indirect reciprocity, we're assuming that the the group is uh, is larger than two. Um, and then if you imagine actually building that model, just imagine it. How are you going to model indirect reciprocity? You're going to have to assume that social interactions take place in groups, and then there's some individuals are indirect reciprocators. So when somebody's nice to them, then they're nice to somebody else. So you have to throw in some cheaters in the model to make it interesting. Mm. And so... Um, and so now there's cheaters. If you're nice to them, they don't pay it forward, so they get the advantage. How does that go? And um, as soon as you build those models, then what happens in each and every case is that the logic of multi-level selection uh, emerges hmm. in these in these models. So they have to assume the existence of groups, if only groups of size two. Uh, they have to assume the existence of non-cooperators in addition to cooperators. And, and danged if the non-cooperators don't have the advantage within the socially interacting groups. Uh, for example, tit for tat, the famous reciprocal strategy, uh, basically says, uh, start out nice. And then if your partner is nice, then you continue to be nice. If your partner is not nice, then you just mirror your partner. So imagine tit for tat with a non-cooperator. They form a pair. First time around, tit for tat's nice. Non-cooperator is not nice. Next time around, tit for tat's not nice. And that's how it continues until the end of the relationship. Well, who has the highest relative fitness? It's not tit for tat. Because tit for tat lost the first round. And after that, it was just, it was parody. <laughs> and so tit for tat can never beat its partner. Tit for tat always loses or draws in the its interactions with its social partners. The only way tit for tat evolves is when there's when it's paired up with another tit for tat, <laughs> and then that pairing does better than the mixed pairing or the pairing of two non cooperators. So the entire logic of a multi level selection model is contained within two person within two person. Game yeah. theory, isn't that interesting? Wow, because it's like a it's like a one shot two player sort of problem. So it's inherently group selectionist. Yeah, except now if you read the current literature, including my recent long, long conversation with Jonathan Birch, which was on this year of Life, the magazine. Yeah, and then um, still you get people saying, 
how can you say that a that a pair in a one shot game theory is a group? How can you do that? I said, how the fuck? Why wouldn't you do that? <laughs> It just makes no sense to me. Why isn't a pair group, no matter how long the uh, yeah. the duration? But there's still a lot of pushback, even among experts, on the idea that that the pairs of two-person game theory might be considered a social group, the social group of a group selection mm. model. Like, I mean, if a pair isn't a group, then what is it? Yeah, so... Uh, so a lot of the current discourse, which is intelligent discourse, I mean, these are not stupid no. people, but uh, smart people like uh, Jonathan Birch uh, think that um, groups need to be defined in some ways that's actually quite restrictive, unless it has a boundary and, mm. and, uh, and um um, you know, a clear boundary, then uh, it doesn't count as a uh, doesn't count as a um, as a group. And here's where pluralism comes in. It turns out that that matters less than you might think. That if if I have my very general definition of groups and they have a more restrictive definition of groups, there's still a kind of a multifactorial parameter space that we all need to face. We're carving it up with our words in different ways but uh, uh, but uh, actually we're confronted with the same very complex world uh, we feel the need to carve it up in in different ways and and that's why we need a translation manual in order to understand each other basically it's like mm. speaking different languages mm. and that's why the idea that um, and that's okay because um, different perspectives can be a good thing so to a degree it's okay that we have theories that are, are basically confronting the same complex world and parsing it in in different ways, but only if we have a translation manual. If we don't, then we run the risk of a person who speaks English declaring other languages as as wrong and and uh, uh, and confusing. Hmm. So, Dave, we've mentioned kin selection, reciprocal altruism, and indirect reciprocity as selfish gene accounts for altruistic behavior. Is there anything we've left out in the selfish gene worldview as far as explaining altruistic behavior is concerned? Sure, there is. And, and uh, we, I'll give two examples that really go beyond either of those. Uh, mm. One example is microbiomes. And now microbiomes uh, uh, didn't really burst on the scene until 2000, I think, is when the word was coined. Before then, we kind of thought of an individual as a as a just a genotype, hmm. genetically homogenous. Now we know that every individual is a planet inhabited by um, trillions of bacterial and other small. Uh, uh, species, thousands of species, numbering in the trillions of of, um, of individuals. But do you know that microbiomes vary? Um, and of course, those differences make a difference. And uh, and that uh, microbiomes are thoroughly integrated with our our genotypes. And so, if you think of selection at the level of ecosystems, uh, in this case, microbiomes, uh, you're not going to explain that by kin selection, direct reciprocity or indirect reciprocity. These are very, very complex systems. Nevertheless, they vary. Those differences make a difference. And danged if there's not enough replication for it to complete the three ingredients of, a, of an evolutionary process. I've actually done experiments in the lab at the ecosystem level. So this can be duplicated in the, in the uh, laboratory. So so uh, now let's look at large human systems uh, mm. at the level of nations, for example. Um, that goes way beyond kin selection, direct reciprocity, or indirect reciprocity. But do you know that large human groups differ? Sure they do. And do you know if those differences, that those differences make a difference and there's some degree of, of replication? And so when, when the units of selection are complex systems, then... Different rules are at play um, that result in the three ingredients of, of an evolutionary 
process. This is still a pretty, pretty new territory hmm. of uh, multi -le multi level selection in in complex systems. And here, the idea of multiple local equilibrium, multiple basins of attraction. We know with complex interactions that uh, complex systems that there is uh, uh, many locally stable uh, zones that the system can exist in. And each system, because it's locally stable, it's locally stable. Um, but they differ in their group level properties. To be stable is not to say that you're functioning well as a group. Think of human regimes. A human regime is stable, but it can be despotic. Some of the worst human societies are are stable. We wish they were less stable. They work terribly as as societies, but they're still stable. And so, and so, in this case, multi-level selection takes the form of selection among equilibria. Hmm. The selection of the equilibria that work best compared to those that don't work so uh, well. That's a whole new ball game. That was not. That cannot be imagined uh, in terms of kin selection reciprocity or indirect reciprocity, but it's definitely what's going on all around us. So I want to ask you now, Dave, why multi-level selection provides the better explanation of altruistic behavior. And we've, we've already covered some reasons, but first you better tell us how you define groups because you have a rather fluid definition of what groups are. So first, I'll, I'll, in in the spirit of equivalence, mm. um, I won't claim that it provides a better explanation, um, because I'm happy to acknowledge that uh, that um, e even the selfish gene perspective is in is insightful. So um, if we're really going to acknowledge the the uh, the benefits of multiple perspectives, then uh, then all perspectives basically are that. There's a limit to the number of these things you want. Okay. Um, I covered that in my conversation with uh, with um, uh, Jonathan Birch. So anyhow, let's be let's be true to the concept of uh, of um, of equivalence. And what was the second part of your question? How do you define groups? Right. So um, uh, and here's where we have differences of opinion among the the. Uh, Cognoscenti. Mm. Uh, the, but I feel quite strongly that uh, uh, a group can be meaningfully defined as the set of individuals that are socially interacting with each other. Mm. And that is always with respect to a particular trait. When w evolutionists are typically studying one trait at a time. We study aggression, or we study altruism, or we study sex ratio. Basically, we're studying a single aspect of a species, and we want to know how did that evolve. Uh, we're not studying the species as a whole. We're studying a particular trait of a of a species. And if it's a social trait, then here's here's how I often I often put it. Back to the idea of a non-social trait. If it's a trait that just influences your fitness, then I know your fitness if I know your trait. But if it's a social behavior, I don't know your fitness if I know your trait. If I, if I know that you're an altruist or a selfish individual, I do not know your fitness. Hmm. I need to know who you're interacting with. Only then can I determine your fitness as an individual. Now, who are you interacting with? That depends on the trait. That's why in, in game theory, we call it N person game theory. N is the number of individuals that are socially interacting with each other. If, if the biological situation is such that when I uh, uh, behave, then I'm influencing the fitness of six other individuals, well, it's got to be six person game theory. Five person or seven person won't do. So the value of N is determined by the biological situation. So the idea that, that, and this is true for any theory of social evolution, in order to calculate the fitness of an individual, you must know 
the other individuals with whom it is interacting. Otherwise, you cannot get started. And that's my definition of group. Right then and there, that's my definition of group. It's the set of individuals that are influencing each other's fitness. Mm. Now, for me, that is appealingly general. In the first place, it's information that's required by any model. And in the second place, it intuitively corresponds to what we mean as a group. It happens to be a very general definition um, and even includes, for example, ephemeral groups of small numbers of individuals. But I'm fine with that. That's my definition of group. Hmm. Fantastic. And I think there's one one other thing we should talk about while we're on the topic of altruism, Dave, and that is the averaging fallacy. Are you happy to explain that to us? Uh, in a sense, we already have. It's when you yeah. average the... the it's, well, I'll, I'll give a technical definition and then try to unpack it. Uh-huh. It's, when you average, it's when you average the fitness of uh, lower-level units across higher-level units. It's actually derived from the concept of average effects in population genetics theory. So let's say that in a standard population genetics model, the kind of thing you learned in high school, you want to know the fitness of a of two alleles, big A and little a. Well, big A exists in two forms. It exists in the homozygote form and in the heterozygote form. Mm. If you want to know the fitness of big A, you take a weighted average, basically. So also for little a. So you calculate the fitness of the two alleles as a weighted average of the its fitness in its two genotypic uh, combination. It's a very useful thing to do because it predicts what ultimately is going to evolve. We want to know when is one allele going to evolve against the other allele, all things considered. So you average across all of its genotypic combination. Likewise, in a game theory model, we don't have genes typically. We're just talking about individual strategies. But if you want to know whether tit for tat evolves compared to uh, non cooperate uh, you want to average the fitness of tit for tat across all combinations. Tit for tat exists in sometimes it's paired with other tit for tat, sometimes it's paired with non cooperators. What's the average? What's, what's its average uh, uh, fitness? So mm-hmm. Averaging the fitness of the lower level units across the higher level units, it's what you need to do in order to know what evolves all things considered, but just don't call it an argument against group selection. Yeah. If you want to, if you want to evaluate group selection, you must compare the fitness of units within the next higher unit. And so it's a fallacy to, to use this averaging approach and call it an argument against group selection. It's not a bad thing to do, but it's not an argument against group Mm. selection. That's the averaging fallacy. Fantastic. I have only a a few more group selection related questions here. Uh, One of them is in relation to a common critique you hear of group selection, which I've heard advanced by both Dawkins and Steven Pinker. And that is to describe this distinction between what Dawkins originally called replicators, which are the genes, and their vehicles, which are the phenotypes or the bodies that they occupy, and to then sort of pillory group selection by saying that groups can't be replicators. You know, I think Pinker once wrote in, you know, his uh, Edge.org article, the, The False Allure of group selection it's not like the roman empire produced a a lineage of baby roman empires so it's incoherent to think of groups as being able to be selected because they're not replicators in the same way that genes are i know you have a very good response to that uh what what is your response well basically it's the averaging fallacy to to um to um um group selection never envision groups as as replicators it's a, it envision groups as as vehicles if you i mean the exactly. vehicle concept <laughs> yeah. is basically yeah. is basically giving back with one hand what it took away with the other yeah. selfish gene theory 
takes away groups as units of selection, as replicators, and then gives back groups as, as vehicles of selection. Group mm. selection has always been a question about how genes evolve. Genes are the replicators in all group selection models. Genes are the replicators. The question is, how do they evolve? Do they evolve by virtue of an advantage within groups or by virtue of advantage between groups? So it is an elementary error <laughs> to use. It is. I can't help but say it. It is. Yeah. And shame, shame on Steve Pinker for making such an elementary error. And shame yeah. on the rest of the world for following him off the cliff. Mm. Um, that's the best example of prestige bias I know. The Steve Pinker says it, and everyone follows him like sheep. So yeah. uh, I think, uh, like even 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 people like other smart people, like Michael Shermer. There there are so many people who follow Steve off this cliff just because he's Steve Pinker, uh, who, who don't don't actually do their own research. Don't get me started. Um, but I mean, so, uh, St I mean, Steve's a smart man. I'm sure you've spoken to him about this. What What's his response when you lay it out for him? Well, if you read that essay and then read the comments following the essay, yeah, there's one by myself, among others. I read it. There's yeah. one by Joe Henrik. And, but and, but and I, what, I, what I want to know is up. what I want to know is what was his response to your response? Was it enough to change his mind? No, it certainly was not. And then those commentaries are not read by anyone. It's just the great Steve Pinker says it, and so we'll believe it. I mean, it's it's just it's so discouraging, basically, because as scientists, we're supposed to be discerning. Yeah. And the, the amount of followership that takes place is discouraging. I found his his critique incredibly rhetorical. I think that's probably the best word to describe it. Uh, yes, yes. Now, I mean, a lot of the confusion, which is shared by people that are better informed, so I think it's a legitimate uh, uh, point of zone contention. Of okay, right. Yeah, zone, zone of inquiry is, is just yeah. uh, what we mean by, by uh, groups. There's, there's actually two major topics that, that, need to be distinguished. One is altruism, which we've been talking about. Mm. The other is the idea of major evolutionary transitions, the idea that that uh, when a group becomes sufficiently cooperative, it actually becomes a higher level organism. At this point, it takes on a boundary, a skin, um, um, and really becomes, you know, compartmentalized. And it certainly becomes a group in a sense that's different than these much looser groups. Mm. And so many people have that kind of group in mind when they, for group selection as a whole, what they lose sight of is that, is the other major question about group selection, how do altruistic traits evolve? And the groups that are required for that need not have that kind of coherence at all. Mm. Um, they can be fuzzy, they need not be discrete, they can dissolve, uh, but they have enough coherence so that they provide that counterforce um, that, um, that basically compensates for the, selective, the local selective um, disadvantage. And if you have a good understanding of the history of the subject, then you would not make that mistake. But many mm. people, many people, um, uh, many people don't. Yeah. Another error I think Dawkins and Pinker seem to commit is just overlooking or ignoring evidence of behaviors which are incredibly groupish. Um, you know, just to pick to pick one example to illustrate what I mean, I wanted to ask you about shared intentionality. And in his book, The Righteous Mind, John Haidt gives a very lucid defense of group selection and he presents it as like a criminal trial where uh, he argues we should reopen the trial against group selection and presents four major exhibits in defense of group selection and and the the second one is shared intentionality which the the the, the concept was advanced by Mike Tomasello in his study of you know chimps versus toddlers for example 
And I find shared intentionality so interesting. It's also interesting to me because it, it really seems to be the first, as Height says, major Rubicon crossing for our species. Um, you know, Yuval Noah Harari's book Sapiens is very famous for holding up language, the development of language about 70,000 years ago as the first major Rubicon crossing and, and describes it as the cognitive revolution, the first of sort of the four major thresholds in his book Sapiens. But Shared intentionality is interesting because you could argue that that was really the first major turning point for our species, which occurred about 130,000 years before uh, the development of language, and that it's more important because what is language if not an agreement as to what sounds mean in relation to uh, you know you know their meaning? Uh, so shared intentionality is quite an important concept. It forms the bedrock of a lot of important aspects of our you know modern lives for example conformity uh is is rooted in shared intentionality and i I wanted to ask you how do you think about shared intentionality and do you treat it as a strong piece of evidence in favor of group selection and humanity uh so my answer is yes and no um if you're if you're operating within the framework of multi-level selection theory then uh, shared intense intentionality is everything that you that you say. Basically, yeah. individuals are now merging their intentions, okay, in a way that's providing a joint benefit. Uh, they're not generating fitness differences within groups, quite the opposite. So shared intentionality is a form of cooperation. Uh, but really, uh, when you flip to the other framework, uh, there's nothing that you cannot explain as individualistic. So if shared intentionality evolves, then those who engage in it are more fit than those who didn't, mm. all things considered. And so it's easy to provide a kind of a individualistic rationale that, uh, yeah, just imagine that you're an individual that's suitably omniscient. And you're evaluating your options. You're going to merge your intentionality or you're not. And it turns out it's better to merge your intentionality. So you do. So it's selfish to be to merge your intentionality. I mean, look at the way Dawkins talks about selfish genes. In actual fact, gene action is thoroughly merged with other genes. Genes don't have isolated effects. Genes are thoroughly melded with other genes, but that doesn't prevent Dawkins from describing them as selfish. So by the same reasoning, no matter how groupish humans become in their intentionality or their cognition, no matter how much they merge their minds with other uh, with other individuals, you can still describe that as selfish whenever it works, basically. Mm-hmm. Because okay. So that's where I think that uh, uh, you won't find anything that you can explain in terms of group selection that cannot be explained from this other perspective. That's another another uh, implication of of uh, equivalence. It's kind of futile, hmm. even even to look because we're describing the same thing in different in different ways. Yeah. What's your relationship like with Dawkins? No, no relationship. Hmm. Is it is it hostile? Well, I mean, it's been extremely minimal. Uh, uh, I mean, it consists of pot shots in the literature. Right. Um, and uh, I've, I've, we've actually been in the same room only a, a few uh, a few times. So it's, uh, yeah, and not, not an interesting story to, to tell. I mean, whatever relationship exists is actually preserved in our, our respective uh, mm. Um, publications. But I do think that people should think seriously about why is it that a small number of people achieve iconic status? Uh, That's not the way science works at all. And Dawkins in particular has not contributed to the peer-reviewed literature in many, many decades. And so why is it that he looms so large in the public imagination when in fact he has not contributed to the scientific literature in a long, long time. So let's think about that. 
what's your explanation? Why do we personify things, for example? I mean, we always, I mean, often look at the great figures, Freud, Skinner, so on. I think there is a need to kind of hinge ideas onto people. And if the ideas are important, then that kind of gives everlasting life to the people that they're uh, associated with, something along Something along uh, along those lines. Hmm. Can't do much. Can't do much better than that. Yeah. Max Planck famously observed that science progresses one funeral at a time. Do you think the group selection debate is a strong example of that? Only for some people, but not others. Uh, there's no differences that way. Yeah. Uh, compare Dawkins. Dawkins uh, is definitely that sort. But look at Hamilton. Hamilton uh, very freely changed his mind in the 1970s about group selection when he was influenced by by um, Price. So Dawkins, uh, Hamilton had a flexible mind. Uh, Dawkins not so much. Um, mm. So it's uh, it's not uh, it's not invariable by uh, by any means. And there's young people with inflexible um, minds. So, but it certainly is the case that people go to their graves without changing their uh, mm. Uh, without changing their mind. Do you think it might be relatively harder to change your mind if you write an international bestseller? <laughs> You're sort of building a prison for yourself with your own words, aren't you? It's hard to do an uh, about perhaps. face. Hard to do an about face after that. Yeah, although uh, yes, true, of course. But I'm trying to search for deeper explanations, and I think that yeah. one interesting point to make is that uh, there are. Uh, people outside of science have worldviews that uh, are very difficult to to uh, change. Really, if we think about this in terms of uh, people in general and and cultures in general, then the idea of stasis and and getting stuck, I think, um, uh, and having certain temperaments uh, makes a lot more sense. And then what goes on in science is just a manifestation of what goes on much more much more generally. And I think all of us know people that are very individualistic in their perspective. They do see everything through the lens of, of um, individual self-interest. And in each and every case, anyone who thinks of selfishness as some grand explanatory principle must distinguish good from bad types of selfishness. Take Ayn Rand for for example, um, mm. everything for her was selfish, but she still distinguished between good forms of selfishness and bad forms of selfishness. Tocqueville said, you know, selfishness properly, rightly understood. There's enlightened self-interest and then some other kind of, of self-interest. So if you're going to use self-interest as a grand explanatory principle, then you must split them somewhere down the line. There's other people that, that want to think about um, selfishness is not something that explains. Uh, basically, you reserve that word for the way you shouldn't behave, and then you use other words for the way that you should behave. So mm -hmm. you can say something like, don't be selfish. You'll be better off if you're not selfish, which is a contradiction of terms uh, uh, for someone who treats selfishness as a grand explanatory principle. Well, there is a mental polymorphism, a cognitive polymorphism that exists in everyday life. Why is that? Why is that? Uh, that uh, does that polymorphism exist? It's a good question to ask. How are they maintained in a population? Hmm. So let's talk about religion. How do you define religion? Well, it's really interesting that not me, but in the literature, there are two major definitions of religions, and they are completely different from each other. That is so interesting. <laughs> One, of course, defines religions in terms of belief in supernatural agents. And the other is Durkheim's definition. 
which is religion is a, uh, oh, basically it's a systems of beliefs um, organized around the sacred that form into one single community called a church. Uh, so Durkheim defined uh, uh, religions as a systems of thought that basically help to organize communities. And, and, he, and, he, and he pinpointed the concept of sacredness as, as fundamental. He actually didn't say a thing in that definition about supernatural agents. So there are your two definitions of, uh, of, um, of religion. Hmm. Now, why, why do religions exist in your, your view? So I, uh, the first move I make is to uh, say that we should be thinking not about religions per se, but about meaning systems. And the fact that, and this actually gets back to Tomasello and the idea of shared intentions, mm. and that uh, something that's truly distinctive about our, our species is uh, our capacity for symbolic thought. Um, when I write about that now, I say that uh, that each and every one of us has a set of genes, that's our genotype, but we also have a set of symbols, let's call it our symbotype. And our behaviors are, are uh, based at least as much as our symbotypes as our genotypes. And a symbotype, the symbolic system that we have, might or might not count as religious. So let's first ask, what can we say about our symbotypes, our meaning systems, and then we can think about religion as a type of, uh, as a type of meaning systems. That to me is the most instructive thing for us to uh, for us to do. So thinking about meaning systems. In general, um, what they do is they basically they receive and process information leading to action. That's what a, a, a meaning system does. It organizes the way we see the world, how we process information, and ultimately how we act. So that makes a meaning system like a brain. A brain receives information, processes it, and results in action. So does a meaning system. So you can you can call a meaning system the brain of a culture. Isn't that interesting? And then you can ask the question, for any element of the meaning system, let's evaluate it in two ways. First of all, how well does this belief reflect what's actually out there? Is it factual in the scientific sense of the word? And what does that belief cause people to do? So I call this factual realism and practical realism, and any belief could be scored on both bases. Okay, that's interesting enough. And now let's ask the question, how do meaning systems evolve? Well, it's on the basis of practical realism. Evolution is only sensitive to what we do, and so we can predict that meaning systems evolve basically on the strength of what they cause people to do. They're much more sensitive to practical realism than factual realism. How do we ever perceive the world the way it is? Well, that depends on the relationship between practical realism and factual realism. When is it advantageous to see the world the way it really is? And when is it advantageous to, to basically believe in departures of factual reality? What's the trade-off between factual realism and practical realism? And we can immediately see that that's a complex trade-off. Sometimes it's a positive trade-off, sometimes it's a negative trade-off. So the idea of adaptive fictions, mm. the idea that we're the idea that we're built and designed to invent, believe, and defend falsehoods is something that makes perfect sense for all meaning systems, not just religions. Hmm. So and so now we get to the idea that what 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 strikes people is so odd about religions is two things. First of all, why do why do religious believers believe all that stuff that's not out there? And then why does it cause them to do such impractical things? 
why would Abraham sacrifice his son for an imaginary God, for, for example? And so that's why religion uh, more or less cries out for a explanation. But when you look at it as one kind of meaning system, then that problem exists for all meaning systems, not just not just religious meaning systems. All meaning systems should have uh, uh, adaptive adaptive fictions. Hmm. We originally got in touch with each other after my interview with Brett Weinstein. And in that interview, I, I spoke with Brett about his view on religion and how it evolved. He also spoke with Dawkins at the end of 2018 uh, and confronted him on stage by turning two of his ideas against each other, the idea of a meme, a meme being a unit of cultural evolution, and Dawkins' idea of the extended phenotype. And Brett argues that religion is an extended phenotype. He argued that to Dawkins. And when I first heard him making that argument when I was watching the video of the debate, I assumed that he was invoking group selection uh, to explain how religion evolved because he, he was arguing religion was an adaptation. Um, and uh, as I researched further in preparation for my interview with him, I realized that wasn't what he was saying at all. In, in fact, I think I might have stumbled upon a Twitter thread, a conversation between you and Brett, um, where, you, where you asked him, were, were you invoking group selection? And he replied that he wasn't. And I tried to dig deeper with him on this question in my interview with him. But I have to confess that I still don't understand how uh, he gets to religion is extended phenotype without invoking group selection. And I couldn't deduce it from my conversation with him. I thought maybe he was keeping his his cards close to his chest uh, to, to save his, his idea for the debate uh, that, that he's going to have with you at some point in the future about this question. And still I've been trying to think through intuitively how does Brett uh, come to his conclusion without using group selection and I can't think of a way. Um, let, let's kind of freestyle here. How would if if you had a gun pointed to your head and you had to do it? How would you, how would you prosecute the argument? What what do you think the best version of Brett's uh, argument would be? Well, this is uh, there's a number of uh, threads to disentangle. Let's begin with Dawkins on uh, on religion. Yeah, we, and, should exp uh, we should explain that first. Sorry. Thank you. And this actually goes back to the very beginning of our conversation. If we asked, you know, is there more to evolution than natural selection? Mm. Um, and the answer to that was yes. Uh, there are such things as byproducts. Uh, you know, why is a uh, um, moth attracted to flame? It's not good for it. Um, turns out that moths are navigate by the stars. Mm. Um and uh, that causes them to spiral towards light and all that. So, so, um, so often um, organisms do d things that are destructive, and that could be explained as a, a byproduct. I think that uh, Dawkins and other of the so-called new atheists start out with a commitment to the idea that religions are bad, bad, bad. Mm. They're hostile towards religion. Because they're, they work they're working off that definition of religion is a, uh, a set of, of ontological claims, not the idea that religion is some sort of moral community? Well, uh, I think first and foremost, they are hostile towards religion, and then they assemble their arguments in order to defend that, that claim. That means when they try to come up with an evolutionary argument, they're going to say religion is a, is a, is a toxic byproduct. Or maybe it's a mismatch. Maybe it was adaptive in the past, but not the, but not, not the present. Whatever it is, it's bad, bad, bad. If you look at the titles of those books, The mm -hmm. God Delusion, God is Not Great, um, um, uh, so on and um, so on and so forth, uh, there's a real commitment to the idea that uh, religion is bad, and if it ceased to exist altogether, then uh, we'd all be we'd all be better for it. Now. Dawkins certainly could, it's certainly within his intellectual framework to think of religion as an extended phenotype. After all, he wrote the book. Mm. 
<laughs> but he's not going to go there because he just does not want to think about religion as an adaptation in any sense at all. And so he's stuck. He's stuck a, with calling it a mind virus. In a sense, then, is he not committing the naturalistic fallacy? I mean, either he thinks that if he calls religion an adaptation, he's theref- therefore somehow saying that it's good. That would be the naturalistic fallacy. Dawkins is very smart. Maybe he's not committing the naturalistic fallacy. He just thinks that it's it's going to be more difficult to rid the world of religion if he admits that it is an adaptation. Um, um, maybe so, but, you know, I mean, it is so... Um, well, well, I guess I'm speculating on it. Well, uh, let me just point out that as someone who's been studying religion as a scholar mm. for 20 years now, I know the community of people that are doing the serious study of religion from an evolutionary perspective, and the new atheists are not among them, not among them at all. They don't even care about that. Hmm. literature the disconnect between Dawkins Dennett and Harris and and the deceased Hitchens who are actually using the mantle of of science and and evolution when they don't care a fig about the actual serious study of religion from an evolutionary perspective is plain for anyone to see and any citation analysis would would uh, would uh, would uh, demonstrate it. So there's that. And it doesn't matter how intelligent somebody is. Very intelligent people are climate deniers and so on, and and evolution deniers. It's not a matter of their intelligence. It's a matter yeah. of their their uh, uh, commitment. But to return to the difference between um, Dawkins and, and Brett, hmm. uh, Brett is very happy to see religion as a adaptation, unlike Dawkins. Okay. Mm. Now, now we come to how does Brett explain religion as an adaptation? Um, he's drawn to the idea that it's an extended phenotype, uh, and in his mind, that's like not a group selection explanation. Um, in my own personal conversation with Brett who I admire in many respects, by the way. I feel like I have more in common with Brett than I have not in common. If you just hold group selection aside, mm. then I think that uh, that uh, we're more or less on the, on, the, uh, on the same page. Anyhow, in my actually quite brief conversations with Brett, he says, no, it's not group selection. It's something called lineage selection. What's lineage selection, I ask him. Oh, well, actually, that's something he's kind of invented for himself, it seems. There's not much of a literature um, on it, which by itself is just like, please. Uh, This is not how scholarship takes place. So what we have, I think, is another manifestation of the tendency to want to explain what are, in fact, what in, in terms of multi-level selection should be called a group-level adaptation in more individualistic, uh, more individualistic uh, terms. At the end of the day, it's going to be some version of equivalence. We're going to be talking about the same goddamn thing using uh, different words. The fact is, is that religions... Uh, most enduring religions uh, succeed by creating strong communities. If you want to think of that in individualistic terms, well, then go for it. But um, um, a proper understanding will show some version of uh, of, um, of equivalence. Mm-hmm. Do you know much about the content of Brett's lineage selection idea? No, because he hasn't published anything on it and he hasn't talked about it. What I know is uh, is his pedigree, and I know I mean the most detailed information is his conversation with you. Hmm. You have to understand. Let's talk about this a little bit because it's quite interesting, and I'm not being disparaging because again I I admire Brett, especially given what happened to him, and you did a great job of summarizing uh, his experience at Evergreen uh, College, and now. One reason that he is so uh, 
uh, influential is because he stands for someone who's been abused and is now making a go as a public intellectual. Um, and I admire him uh, for that. Mm. But the fact is, is that as a professor at a very small college, uh, with mostly it was a teaching position, um, he has a very thin publication record. He's written exactly one paper with somebody else that even touches upon the topic of, of, uh, of a group selection. He's a very smart man. Um, uh, but nevertheless, uh, if uh, he's not some kind of a sage on the topic of multi-level uh, selection. Um, I know his pedigree, and when he talked about it um, to you, then uh, it was pretty obvious to me that uh, although he's courageous in many ways, he's a seed that has not fallen far from the tree of his mentor, Richard Alexander. Dick Alexander managed to think of all of morality in terms of self-interest. And I wrote a whole paper on, on uh, Alexander's views and how it's yet another case of, of, uh, of uh, redescribing group selection in, in uh, other terms. And so now here we go again as far as, as, uh, as uh, I'm concerned. Uh, there is a small literature on lineage selection, but it's not what Brett has in mind. I don't know what he has in mind. Whatever it is, it's going to be some new construction and... Um, and I hope that he takes the care to relate it to what came, uh, what came uh, before. This whole field is plagued by, like, independent inventions, uh, reinventing the wheel. You might, you might, uh, uh, you might say. So, so um, again, I, I, uh, I feel a lot uh, uh, in common with. Uh, with Brad, he thinks evolution is important. He thinks religion is a as an adaptation. He thinks it's important to have respectful discourse, mm. uh, to be able to tackle difficult subjects. Uh, I admire uh, all of that. On the on the topic of group selection, I'm not waiting with bated breath to hear what Brett has to say. Mm -hmm. So to summarize, to summarize your position, you suspect that group selection is a dirty word for Brett and that he has coined a new theory, lineage selection, which is probably group selection by another name. Um, yes. And at the, um, um, at the um, end of my long conversation with Jonathan Birch on This Year of Life magazine, yeah. Birch being a, a real scholar on the topic. So actually, let me just to your uh, listeners um, uh, describe this. I mean, who's really worthy to talk about? Uh, not Dawkins, not Brad, somebody that's actually very well respected in the peer of your literature. That person is named Jonathan Birch. He does not have a lot of name recognition. Perhaps he should, but he really knows his stuff. And so mm. We went to uh, uh, have a long, long conversation. And, and at the end of it, I made this comparison. Lately, I've become fascinated by open source software development as a amazing example of cooperation, large-scale cooperation in modern human life. And when you look at the development of software such as Linux, where many, many people are contributing code there is a very strong need to keep that code consistent. Um, everyone has to be speaking the same computer language. Now, when that doesn't happen, then what happens is separate lineages of code develop that are incompatible with each other. And for the most part, you don't want this to happen. It's called forking. Hmm. And so sometimes forking is okay when these separate lineages become adapted to different uh, purposes. They don't need to communicate. But for the most part, elaborate measures are taken to eliminate uh, forking. Forking is a bad thing. Now, the point of that that I made to uh, Jonathan Birch is that in some respects, all of these different theories of social evolution 
are like forking. Somebody comes up with a new formulation. They haven't related it to other formulations. The peer review process acts against this a little bit, but not nearly as much as the oversight process with open source software development. And so what you get is forking in a way that is unhelpful. Somebody has reinvented the wheel, and this is a kind of pluralism that's not worth uh, wanting. And Jonathan more or less agreed with me that in addition to uh, uh, different perspectives that are useful, then there's also uh, ones that are actually unhelpful. There's too many of them. Mm -hmm. And we need to have more quality control in terms of these uh, uh, reinventing the uh, uh, reinventing the wheel. And so if if uh, if uh, if um, Brett wants to come up with some concept of lineage selection, uh, be my guest. But let's not have unhelpful forking. Let's mm -hmm. have real quality control where he relates that idea to what came what came uh, before. Mm. It really bogs down the analysis and almost forces evolutionary biologists to become philosophers of language because now you need to pass the different terms, the different names for the various theories, say this one is actually equivalent to this one. Um, and it's like, a, a, like it's, it's incredibly inefficient. Yeah, that's why it's important not to have too many of these. But it actually brings us into the realm of a multiculturalism, that if you go outside science and now you talk to someone from a different culture, then you're going to have all these problems, aren't you? Hmm. And so, uh, and the solution to avoid misunderstanding is there has to be a process of achieving mutual uh, understanding. But if a scientific community was operating uh well, it would hold that to a minimum, basically. Mm -hmm. This is this is what's needed to prevent a tower of uh, a tower of um, of Babel. And mm -hmm. I think that actual scientific communities uh, succeed to uh, two different degrees. And one thing about evolution, returning to evolutionary theory as a whole, is that it does provide a common language. Uh, if you read my any of my books, including my most recent one. It's all about, and this goes beyond group selection, basically this view of life, evolutionary theory, as a unifying theoretical framework that can solve this Tower of Babel um, uh, problem. That's a statement mm -hmm. which goes way beyond uh, uh, group selection. Group selection is not the only thing I do. So, um, so really the most important thing is to have a common theoretical language and that language is a combination of evolutionary theory and complexity theory. And I think that at that scale, Brett would probably agree with me. He would he would wish he would wish evolutionary theory to become much more broadly known and uh, applied. Hmm. I've got one more question related to religion and group selection, and then I want to ask you about moving evolutionary theory into the real world, so to speak, and, and finish on that. Um, the, the question about religion, just to wrap this section of the conversation up, is I was hoping you could tell us the story of how the Jewish community survived around the time of the Seleucid persecution of 167 to 164 BC um, by developing a belief in the afterlife. Right, so uh, this is fascinating. This in, it is indeed, um, and what it means is that we can study cultural evolution in the same way as genetic evolution. We can pick a trait, such as belief in the afterlife, mm. and we can ask the historical question: When did it originate, and how did it spread compared to alternative beliefs? And there might be an individualistic explanation, uh, for example, maybe to allay our fear of death. That's a common theory. Or uh, maybe there's a group selection um, explanation. Uh, is the historical record detailed enough to, to, uh, uh, to uh, decide that question? Is there a fact of the matter uh, 
and do we have enough information to uh, to arrive at it? And the answer is yes in this <laughs> hmm. in this case. And so uh, biblical scholarship is so detailed that uh, we can say this: that in the Hebrew Bible, uh, death is mentioned about a thousand times, and uh, in most of these instances, people just die. Uh, they don't go to any afterlife at all. In about 70 mentions, uh, people, there's an afterlife, but it's not heaven. It's more like the Greek Hades. It's Sheol. It's the dismal, dreary place where everyone goes, whether mm -hmm. they've been good or bad. Uh, and Sheol is only mentioned in a certain context when people uh, die without having succeeded in their in their lives. That's when Sheol is mentioned. I've done nothing in my life. Now I'm dying and I'm going to this dreary place called um, Sheol. So when does the concept of the afterlife associated with Christianity, when does it appear in the Hebrew Bible? Not until the book of Daniel, which uh, we know was the last book uh, to be added to the Hebrew Bible. Hmm. And that concept of the afterlife is not about an individual's anxiety about death. It's all about solidarity. Basically, the afterlife is something that's going to happen. Um, it's going to be an end of days, and then um, everyone's going to come back, and, uh, and some will be judged and some uh, won't. The context was intergroup competition within Judaism. Basically, you had um, uh, strict sects that were keeping themselves apart, and you had others that were accommodating to Hellenic culture. And, uh, and the belief in the afterlife was uh, basically a judgment of, uh, against uh, Jews that were accommodating. And it can clearly be understood as a uh, mechanism that created solidarity in between group uh, competition. That was the original uh, um, origination of the concept of the afterlife. Uh, after that, it morphed and has morphed many, many times. So, but uh, this is a case, an example in which we could actually take a cultural trait and we could ask the question, how did it evolve? And even not just ask it in functional terms, but actually have something similar to a fossil record in which we can we can find out when it originated um, and um, and the factors that caused it to uh, to uh, spread hmm. so interesting now I want to leave religion now and ask you about whether all of this the group selection debate evolutionary theory more broadly is its significance is just confined to the academic realm or whether there are insights that we can use to structure our societies and build a better world. And there was an interesting shift in your career where you moved from not just a focus on the academic debates, but to thinking about how we can construct our societies and some of the practical implications of the ideas that you were you were studying. Do, do you remember when that point of inflection was for you? Uh, sure. The first step was when I created our campus-wide evolutionary studies program. Mm. So, um, and there I had a sort of epiphany that although I was having fun as an individual scholar, traveling the world and and interacting with dispersed colleagues, what would it be like to actually have my university? Uh, become more literate about uh, evolution. So I created a program called EVOS that teaches evolution across the curriculum. Mm. And, uh, and so that was step one. And when EVOS was established, then I began to think about my hometown, the city of Binghamton, as like a field site. And when you're an evolutionist, you do field work. You study organisms in their natural environment. So why shouldn't we be studying people in their everyday lives? That's what sociologists do, but 
turns out when you approach it from an evolutionary perspective, it becomes somewhat of a new model. And so, because I was interested in altruism, what I did was I collaborated with our school superintendent, and we gave a survey to all of the public school students in grades 6 through 12. To uh, And basically what that survey measured was two things. First of all, how pro-social are you as an individual? Let's say we could measure that in a survey. How pro-social are you as an individual? And secondly, how pro-social is your social environment? What kind of social support do you get from your family, neighborhood, school, church, and extracurricular activities? Five forms of social support. And evolutionary theory tells us that pro-sociality, being nice to others, in order for it to succeed in a Darwinian world, those who give must get. There must be a correlation between the pro-sociality of the individual and the pro-sociality of their social environment. If you want to think about it, that as the R term in, in inclusive fitness theory, be my guest. Um, in any case, we need that uh, correlation. And that's what we found, actually, an amazingly high correlation uh, uh, was 0.7 between the prosociality of the individual and the prosociality of their social environment. Mm -hmm. If you take that correlation coefficient of 0.7 and you treat it as the R term in inclusive fitness theory, that means that the phenotypic correlation between the individual <laughs> and their social environment is greater than full siblings. <laughs> which is 0.5. Which, which yeah. is point, which is 0.5. So isn't yeah. that incredible <laughs> in a modern funny. American city? And although not, not all forms of social support are spatially based, if you actually then mapped the, the students onto their residential locations and create a map of prosociality in the city of Binghamton, it was incredibly heterogeneous. So basically there were neighborhoods in which these kids were clustered into uh, highly prosocial or non-prosocial neighborhoods. Then we did many other experiments validating the survey. and and things like that. So that's mm -hmm. what it means to study um, a topic such as altruism in the in the real world. And knowing all of that, then what can we do? What kind of what kind of interventions can we do to actually increase prosociality um, mm -hmm. in real world settings? Now you get into more of a implementation mode, which I've been doing ever since. Mm. And do you think you could have arrived at these practical insights without group selection? Yeah, I mean, sure. Uh, yeah. Again, honor, honoring the principle of of, uh, of equivalence, I could have made all those predictions on the basis of a cor correlation yeah. coefficient. So, uh, yeah. But it, I guess it adds strength to the case. Oh, yeah, I think that especially when you're, I mean, in the first place, nobody thought of doing that. And if by, if by inclusive fitness, if by kin selection, you mean real kin, mm. which was the original formulation, mm then the idea that the other forms of social support, I mean, really, at this scale, if you look at the three categories that you mentioned, I mean, here you have this great correlation of 0.7, right? Mm -hmm. Can you explain that by genealogical relatedness? Oh, maybe a little, but not much. Direct reciprocity? I don't think so. Uh, indirect reciprocity? Not that either. Basically, a lot of this has to do with institutions. Mm. And in what sense is an institution like a church, either of those three things? Hmm. So I do think that uh, really uh, the reason that I, I uh, myself uh, think mostly in terms of multi-level selection theory is because I do find it much more uh, informative. Yeah. In your book, This, this View of Life, you have this great piece at the beginning where you talk about what, what a theory is and what a theory does. I wonder, uh, are you aware of uh, Kahneman, Daniel Kahneman's idea of theory-induced blindness? It's probably uh, he's making the same point I am, so why don't you I, yeah. articulate it and then... Yeah, so I, so... I think, uh, again, uh, honoring this idea of equivalence, I think it's probably the same point, but I just thought you might find it interesting that, that, uh, that he, he seems to agree. So this is from Thinking Fast and Slow, his, his uh, book. He's talking about um, why Bernoulli got 
the concept of utility wrong. So quoting here, the mystery is how a conception of the utility of outcomes that is vulnerable to such obvious counterexamples survived for so long. I can explain it only by a weakness of the scholarly mind that I have often observed in myself. I call it theory-induced blindness. Once you have accepted a theory and used it as a tool in your thinking, it is extraordinarily difficult to notice its flaws. If you come upon an observation that does not seem to fit the model, you assume that there must be a perfectly good explanation that you are somehow missing. You give the theory the benefit of the doubt, trusting the community of experts who have accepted it. Many scholars uh, have surely thought at one time or another uh, of the stories of those, uh, such as those of Anthony and Betty or Jack and Jill, who people we mentioned in an earlier explanation, uh, and casually noted that these stories did not jibe with utility theory. But they did not pursue the idea to the point of saying this theory is seriously wrong because it ignores the fact that utility depends on the history of one's wealth, not only on present wealth. As the psychologist Daniel Gilbert observed, disbelieving is hard work and system two is easily tired. End quote. Yeah, so I think that that's very interesting. Um, but can probably be generalized quite um, quite a lot. And that when you think that um, there's so many things to attend to, uh, we can't possibly attend to them all. So that's why we need meaning systems. Mm. A theory is a kind of a is a type of type of uh, meaning systems. But I think that all uh, symbolic systems, in order to in order to see, you must be blind is one way to uh, uh, is one way to uh, put it. You can't forefront some things without pushing other things into the into the uh, uh, background. So that means that nothing is obvious all by itself, uh, only against the background of other other um, beliefs. Everything we do makes sense against the background of some beliefs and blinds us to possibilities. So. Uh, mm. I think that that's uh, that's the most general general um, formulation. That once you see things through an evolutionary lens, then uh, it transforms uh, the obvious. Uh, mm. Things become obvious that were invisible or or regarded as doubt right wrong mm. before. And why should what should be privileged about evolution? Well, because it's a true theory. Mm. So uh, and so we. we Adopting the adopting the evolutionary worldview is perhaps the most important thing to do. Mm. And then, of course, once you have, we have all these controversies that exist within the evolutionary um, uh, worldview. But uh, um, that's uh, in in your book, This View of Life. You have a great quote of Einstein's on the topic of theories. Can you remind me what that was? Well, very simply, the theory decides what we could observe. So. Yeah. Uh, so uh, he was talking about the um, electron orbits hmm. uh, and the fact that you couldn't see the electrons, but nevertheless you could uh, you could make predictions uh, based on their existence uh, that you uh, that you uh, could observe. So, hmm. so what what are some other insights that evolutionary theory has for how we should structure? our societies and our economies. Uh, at the beginning of the conversation, we mentioned Eleanor uh, Ostrom's core design principles. Is there something you'd like to say about that? Well, I think that every subject, every important topic uh, in policy can benefit from an evolutionary perspective, um, although sometimes in different ways. So mismatch theory, for example, the idea that adaptations to past environments can become mismatched to current environments is huge. Um, and uh, even without talking about group selection, you can uh, uh, get a lot of insights from, uh, from uh, that, uh, that concept, including such things as, uh, I, have, I have all examples, as you know, of uh, why are we so many people nearsighted? Why do so many of us need need glasses. It turns out to be a mismatch uh, 
between eye development, which evolved in the context of of um, ancestral environments, and there's something about modern environments that's that's different, and is causing eye development to miss uh, fire. What is it? Mm. Turns out that it's probably time spent indoors. Mm. Then we have uh, then we have um, the hygiene hypothesis, the idea that our immune systems are are uh, malfunctioning because our environments are too clean. As strange as that might seem. And then we have the idea that child development is being subverted by modern child rearing environments. We can't, kids can't play, and it's important for them to, yeah. to play. So here is evolutionary thinking uh, providing a lot of insights before we get into group selection. But when we do get to group selection, then this fundamental uh, problem that Darwin was the first to perceive, the idea that pro-social traits are, are not locally advantageous, mm. and so that therefore we need mechanisms that suppress uh, disruptive behaviors in order for cooperation to take place, is, and that this takes place at every rung of a multi-tier hierarchy is enormously uh, important. It basically provides an, an alternative to the entire concept of laissez-faire in economics. And then at a more mundane level, um, every group uh, of uh, people who are trying to do something together is faced with this faced with this dilemma and typically varies in how well they they cope with it. So just understanding uh, the the basic, dilemma of pro-social traits and then building in uh, features of our groups that uh, are protective can uh, can uh, can do so much it's incredible mm -hmm. so these are these are all things that become quite quite obvious from a evolutionary perspective mm -hmm. it makes one optimistic about um, about the potential for positive positive change uh, once we know what to do yeah. On that, one of the loveliest ideas I've learned about recently, which I learned about through your book, This View of Life, is Jim Cann's social baseline theory. Uh, tell us what that is. He is a, um, a neuroscientist, clinical neuroscientist, and uh, he was seeing a patient who was an old World War II veteran and um, who was experiencing post-traumatic stress syndrome, um, late in life and was resistant to any kind of therapy. He wouldn't do anything that Jim asked him to do. And eventually he said, I want my wife with me. And Jim had never heard this request before. But he said, okay, and his wife came in. And at first, Jim t uh, treated her as a bystander. Uh, and the man was no more receptive than before. And then his wife said, let me hold his hand. So she did, and the old man became suddenly receptive to therapy, very receptive to therapy. And Jim was amazed, and he was asking the question, what was it about holding hands that changed it? Something must have happened in the brain. And so he embarked upon some experiments with normal people, regular people, in which he'd put them in an fMRI machine. He'd threaten them with electric shock, which was very stressful, and then he'd do that under three conditions, alone, holding the hand of a stranger, and holding the hand of a friend. And he was able to duplicate the same effect, that uh, holding the hand of a friend had a tremendous calming effect on the brain. And then a colleague of Jim said, you know, you should be thinking of the holding hands condition as the normal condition, and the alone condition as the abnormal condition. And so Jim started to think, what was the one constant in human evolution? We existed in all these different climates and ecological niches. What was the one constant was to be a member of a highly cooperative group? That's what our ancestors almost always experienced, was that they were members of highly cooperative groups. And that happened enough so that 
basically the brain evolved uh, under those conditions. And the upshot, which is social baseline theory, is that the human brain does not distinguish between individual resources and social resources when it makes its trade-off decisions. It seamlessly integrates individual resources and social uh, uh, resources. And an experiment, not by Jim, but by his colleague, uh, demonstrates how this works. So, so imagine that I, I take you to the base of a steep hill and I ask you to estimate its slope, which you do. And I have you do this under a number of conditions which deplete your personal resources. So with a heavy backpack or not, having fasted or not, having had a workout or not. In each case, when we deplete your personal resources, of course, you should be less inclined to climb the hill. But uh, strangely enough, the way you perceive that is actually to see the hill as steeper. So the more depleted your personal resources are, the steeper the hill um, appears. So against that background, a fourth condition is uh, to be estimating the slope alone or with a friend standing next to you. And as soon as the friend is standing next to you, all of a sudden the slope seems less steep. So what has the brain done? It's basically factored in a social resource, the presence of a friend, in just the same way as personal resources. The brain does not distinguish. And so against that background, the idea that the, the lone person is somehow the, the, the fundamental unit, which is the assumption of economics, that the individual is the self-interested unit, makes all of his decisions without regard to others, seems supremely wrong-headed. Hmm. And, so, and so the best thing you can do for well-being is to be a member of a, of a, uh, of a, nurturing, of a nurturing group. Earlier we said that, that people are more like ants and ant colonies than we, than we might have imagined, and this is a great demonstration of that. The brain expects to be in a cooperative group. And when that's not the case, then the brain becomes alarmed and stressed, and so does the body. And we know this from all the toxic effects of loneliness and, and, and so on. So there's a real paradigmatic change there. It's quite moving in a sense as well. And earlier, I also mentioned John Haidt's metaphor that we are 90% chimp and 10% bee. Where do you put it? Oh, let's say 50%. But, you know, with these things, we don't want to just carve them up. It's like nature and nurture. And they're not just, they're yeah. not just, uh, they're not just uh, additive. I think what it does mean is that when we want to construct multi, when we want to construct large scale societies, we need to have small groups as a cell in multicellular uh, societies. We should get people functioning in small cooperative groups as much as possible. And uh, and uh, so there's a real practical prescription there. How do we do this in a practical sense? How do we bring it to scale? And uh, most of my time now is spent um, uh, working on that objective with something called ProSocial hmm. that uh, we can link to. If you go to prosocial.world, you'll see how we're doing this around the world is hmm. uh, forming people into small groups in a way that we can also study scientifically. Well, Dave, we, we wish you all the best with your work and we'll certainly be linking to ProSocial and all of your other resources. I can't thank you enough for being so generous with your time. We've covered so much ground. And thanks right. for, uh, for joining me in the challenge of trying to translate a lot of these very esoteric ideas to a, a public audience. It's been fantastic. Well, thank you for being so well informed and for uh, providing this uh, information service. Thanks, Dave. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. We covered a lot of ground. For show notes and links to everything we discussed, you can find those on my website, www.josephnoelwalker.com. That's my full name, J-O-S-E-P-H-N-O-E-L-W-A-L-K-E-R.com. I'm also on Twitter. My handle is at Joseph N. Walker. 
Thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. And until next time, ciao.